I'd like to uh, introduce, uh, well, not introduce because you don't, but bring up our city auditor, and he will uh, kick off the uh, Tourism Investment <coughs> Program, or better known as TIP, and the Tourist Advertising Program, TAP, uh, fund audit results. Yeah. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor uh, Dyer, members of the City Council, City Manager Leahy. Thank you for <clears throat> having me here today to present the results of the TIP and the TAP Special Revenue Funds. Um, this was an audit. This was a scheduled audit as part of the fiscal year 20, uh, actually fiscal year 19 audit plan. So the purpose of the audit was to determine whether the TIP and the TAP advertising program special revenue funds were receiving revenue in accordance with the specified <coughs> allocation rates. And when we're talking spe uh, specified allocation rates, uh, those rates are uh, spelled out in various city ordinances. So it was the allocation based on the various city ordinances. Um, and the expenditures from those funds <laughs> were, in fact, appropriate. So we had two main objectives, as, a, as I mentioned. The trust funds uh, receipts were properly allocated in accordance with the specified rates, and the expenditures made from those funds were appropriate. Okay? All right, so what is the period we looked at? We looked at, as part of the audit, uh, going back to fiscal year 16, 17, 18 as well as 19, okay? Um, I did want to mention that while this is the first time that my office, Office of the City Auditor, actually looked at the tip and the tap fund, the uh, Special Revenue Fund is actually audited annually, okay? So there has been some misperception that the fund has never been audited. So it is audited annually. Uh, currently, Clifton, Larson, Allen, who are the, who's the city's external auditors, they audit the tip and the tap special revenue fund annually as part of the CAFR audit. Okay, they look at the revenues, they look at expenditures, and they look at fund balance. Uh, additionally, uh, finance, uh, particularly uh, Kevin Kilbasa here from finance, it performs a monthly re to, a review to ensure what was allocated uh, was, in fact, based on the formulas specified in the ordinances, okay? So th there is a lot of uh, oversight over the tip and the tap special revenue funds, okay? All right, so just uh, more for FYI, right? We've got a lot of new folks on, on council, and, and those uh, watching um, from elsewhere, the tip fund, Okay, what is the TIP? So basically, it, it was the merging of two prior existing funds, the TGIF, Tourism Growth Investment Fund, and the major project funds. So while the two have merged, uh, the purpose is basically the same, which is to provide a source of funding for tourism-related projects and initiatives. So the expenses that we're, we're looking at are going to be related to uh, tourism-related projects and the initiatives and associated costs to support that, okay? Um, as far as the TAP, a lot of people have heard of the TIP. The TAP is the Tourism Advertising Program, okay? And so this was established to be a revenue stream uh, to provide funding for the advertising and marketing program, okay? As we all know, tourism is a very competitive business, um, and so to ensure we get our share of the market, the city obviously needs to advertise. Okay, so when, we're, when we looked at the, the tip and the tap from the audit, you've got various inputs that are coming into the city that are collected, um, what we call as trustee taxes. <clears throat> Basically, a business is collecting a tax on behalf of the city, and then they're remitting periodically those taxes they collected to the city. Okay? So the trustee taxes are the hotel tax, 
the restaurant and meal tax, uh, the amusement tax, and the cigarette tax. Um, then there's some other fees that are paid more directly to the city. So what we focused on were the uh, trustee taxes. Okay, So they're deposited to the city, and then once they get to the city, they're allocated, as you can see, to the TIP fund, to the TAP fund, to the general fund. Okay, So the general fund doesn't miss out. Uh, there's some money that goes to open space, and there's some money that goes to the EDIP as well, which is the Economic Development Investment Program. Okay, So this table that's in the PowerPoint as well as in, in the full report, and uh, I do want to mention for those uh, that are watching, the full report is on our website along with all of our other audit reports at www.vbgov.com slash city auditor. Okay, so you've got the hotel tax rate is 8%. Uh, in Sandbridge, it's 9.5%. But generally around the city, it's 8%. So you've got an allocation of 5% plus a $1 a night uh, fee. The TAP fund gets 1% plus a $1 a night fee. The general fund receives 2%. For the restaurant and meal tax, 5.5%. It's broken down 1.06 to tip, 0.5 to tap, 3.5 to general, and 0.44 to open space. Okay? So every time you eat a meal in the city, that's how it's being allocated. Uh, you have the amusement tax. Okay, this one is simple. 100% of the tax collected goes to the tip fund. So if you're watching a movie, if you're going watching a concert, going to a carnival, uh, you know, watching a sporting event. And a lot of that does occur outside of the oceanfront, but the formula says 100% is going to the TIP fund. Okay? And it's 5% if you're participating, 10% if it's uh, non-participatory sport. All right, cigarette tax, uh, 0.05 cents to the TIP, 0.54 to the general fund general fund, and 16 cents <coughs> to EDIP, okay? So that's, that's the allocation. So what we wanted to ensure is when the money comes in through the various uh, trustee taxes, it is in fact being allocated uh, based on this formula, all right? So what did that allocation yield, okay? So... These were from um, the insight numbers, and just as, as a caveat, when we pulled these numbers, at the time they were not audited, you know, so they may vary a little bit, but it's not going to vary materially, okay, to the audited final, uh, final numbers. But so to give you an idea of what the various taxes are yielding, we're taking in as far as the hotel tax about 37.1 million a year. About 22.7 of that goes to the tip fund. Okay, restaurant and meal tax. Uh, what is that? 60, 69, and about 13.3 goes to the tip. All of the amusement tax, 6.9 million. Cigarette tax is about 10 million 752 million. All right, so uh, approximately to the TIP fund from all the various taxes, trustee taxes, about 43 million, uh, 43 million a year. You can see for the TAP fund, about 13.1 million. And the general fund is getting the bulk of 58.9, $59 million. Okay, so those percentages, that's what it's yielding in regards to. Uh, dollars. All right, and the city put together, and I, we included it just more for informative to, to the reader or, or a FYI of what it actually, uh, you know, a simple example based on the allocation. We've got the Robert, it could be the Roberts family, the Clark family, the Wood family, you know, whoever, whoever's coming in. And we're going to have a lot of those visitors during Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So you get the 8%. Right? You get the uh, $2, and so what does it translate based off of those allocation? You're getting uh, $44, which is 27 goes to the tip based on the formula. 
$10 to the general fund and $7 to the tax. Okay, so for a two-night stay, it's yielding taxes of $44. Assuming they went out to eat, right, everybody has to eat when they come here, and they spend $300 uh, to eat, okay, based on a 5.5% food tax. And the allocation that I just went over, the uh, tip is going to get 318 the TAP 1050 uh, the general fund 1050 and the tap 282, which is yielding $16.50. Okay, and in the in the report we get into you know we actually show the calculation because we do kind of break it down of testing the formula. Okay, and we do the same thing for the meals, and it all and it and it all works out. All right, as far as the, in, in just a lot of more background information of, we saw what we're bringing in, what are we actually spending out of the funds, and you can see the, the, the darker blue is the actual, the lighter blue is the budgeted amount. Okay, and those are, those are in the, the report. We didn't want to clutter the slide, so I put, I put the actual in here. So for fiscal year 19, we're around 34 million, you know. And so it's not the actual amount that's being expended, there's not a big variation from, from year to year. And because we're spending less than budgeted, the remaining is going to the fund balance, which we'll, which we'll take a look at. Okay. So the next slide is the same uh, type of information uh, related to the TAP. Okay, we're spending around uh, last fiscal year around 13 million. Okay, so it's gone uh, you know, sl slightly increase each year, but again, the, the actual amount spent is less than the budgeted. So any remaining <coughs> funds goes to the fund balance. Okay. And so on the very next slide, you can see the fund balance has been growing, okay? Um, and we do have, you know, at the time of the audit, uh, we, we didn't have the 2019, um, but we do have those numbers, and, and it's going to be coming out in, in the CAFR in, in, a, in a few weeks. But just for your information, the fund balance now for the TIP is $27.6 million. And for the TAP, it's 1.4 million. So you can see there's been steady growth in the TIP fund as well as the TAP fund. But a lot of that money is already earmarked for uh, projects that the city has fronted and the bonds have yet to be issued. So while we do have 27.6 million projects such as the Sports Center, Central Beach Convention Center parking, uh, the Pacific <coughs> Avenue, 19th Street Road improvements have been started and the debt to pay for the majority of, of those expenditures uh, will be issued. Okay, so that money, uh, some of that money, not all of it, is um, already accounted for. Okay? All right, so the, getting back to our audit results. Okay, so the first thing we wanted to look at, because there is a lot of question of when the money is coming in, the trustee money is coming in, is it in fact being allocated to the proper respective funds? And we, uh, based on the test work we, we uh, performed, we concluded that the revenues collected were properly allocated uh, in regards to the percentages specified in the ordinances. We didn't have any issues with that, okay? Objective number two, um, we were looking at were the expenditures that were made out of the funds, were they appropriate, okay? And again, we pulled down 100% of the expenditures. So we analyzed 100% of the expenditures for the, uh, for the four fiscal years. 
Then we pulled samples of certain expenditures, things we had questions on to make sure there was, in fact, a documentation to support some of those expenses. In the PowerPoint, I have the top 16 vendors, the cumulative, but in the report, we, we list out for fiscal year 19, the top 16 vendors, 18 and 17. Okay, so we're giving you more details. Many, as you can see, are the same vendors um, and some of the ones that you expect would be at the top, okay? So, for example, the top vendor we paid out of the TIP fund uh, was U.S. Bank and Chase Manhattan, Chase Manhattan. Okay, so that's for uh, bond and principal rep repayment on the various major uh, CIP projects. Okay, number three was IMG, formerly Beach Events. Uh, they handle all the entertainment at the, at the oceanfront. Number four was HRT, Oceanfront <coughs> Trolley, uh, Abacus, uh, the biggest sponsorship of a festival was the Virginia Beach Neptune Festival. Okay, so when we were looking at it, we wanted to ensure that the expenses were, in fact, related to uh, tourism-related um, projects. And if there was equipment such as, number seven, the Peterbilt of Springfield, uh, the garbage truck, or any other vehicles, they were for, in fact, for beach operations. Okay, so we wanted to make sure we weren't buying uh, vehicles that weren't supporting um, that, that ob objective. All right, uh, we do have here a couple of notes, you know, a couple things that uh, certainly weren't inappropriate, uh, but we, we looked into because it did curi you know, catch our curiosity of, of what they were. Um, the Hilton Virginia Beach Oceanfront. And the first thing when I saw that is why are we paying the Hilton Virginia Beach Oceanfront um, $100,000? But per the 31st Street Development Agreement, uh, the developer is entitled to $100,000 reimbursement from the city for entertainment produced by the developer. Okay, so they had their own agreement to have entertainment at 31st Street that they would actually produce. Basically, they engaged the, uh, the artists, okay? And that was under a agreement. And with the recent sale of the Hilton, uh, one of the stipulations was that uh, that agreement and that clause did in fact carry over as well. So the the... Own, the new owners is also entitled to uh, producing their own in entertainment, and per the agreement, uh, will be reimbursed up to $100,000. All right, and then the other thing was um, the iFly. You know, another question when we're looking at is why are we paying 25th Street Associates iFly for the reimbursement of admission taxes? Um, again, there was a signed agreement. We traced it back to supporting documentation um, where the developer is entitled to receive reimbursement incentive payments equal to 50% of the admission taxes collected at the iFly facility, and that was capped at $1.6 million. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Basically, we were trading a, uh, a surface lot for parking garage and that is the uh, dollar amount that was agreed upon. This is a quarterly payment. Um, Kevin from finance, he's monitoring that to make sure that it doesn't exceed the <laughs> dollar amount and the reimbursement is in fact based on the agreement that was made with the developer, okay? So those are the fiscal year 19 top 16 expenses. As I mentioned in the report, we include other fiscal years. All right, as far as the TAP, okay, you can see a lot of this is based off of, of the various vendors we're utilizing. We have now um, 
diversified the contract where I believe in prior years it was uh, it was BCF. So currently that um, that has been brought a lot of the marketing has been brought in house and various firms, not just one firm is being utilized. And again, we looked at 100% of the expenditures. We pulled down a, a sample of expenditures and, and met at the time with the former director um, to go over some of those expenses and, and try to understand. Because marketing today is done a lot different than even five, 10 years ago. You know, there's web-based, there's, uh, you know, your traditional, um, you have your influencers, you know, we actually use influen Instagram influencers, Facebook. So there's a lot of uh, variety in regards to how the city is now marketing to ensure they're reaching uh, the broad variety of potential visitors. Okay. So we looked at all of these, no issues. Um, You know, a lot of it is sponsorship. And again, uh, when you start looking through the comparing from the various fiscal years, you'll see some of the same same type of vendors. OK. All right. So. Um, all right. So in regards to the the the, the tip and the tap. We determined that the tip and the tap funds received revenue in accordance with the uh, specified allocation rates and that the expenditures from those funds were appropriate. Okay, so as it related to the tip and the tap, uh, we did not have any issues. Okay, so there's a second piece we looked at was the Longwoods International. I guess before we get into that section, was there any questions on the tip and the tap. Yes. Yeah, I had a question about um, the agreement with the uh, 31st Street. Thank you. 31st yes. Street. Was that stipulated in the very original agreement that that would move with the ownership? That is correct. Okay. That's what yeah, that correct. is correct. So that was part of the original agreement. I actually uh, reviewed that, and it did say everything passes with the sale. Okay, so it wasn't something that was... That no, it wasn't something that was added on. That was that was part of the uh, agreement. It even had language uh, if the property is sold, this right moves over. Thank you. Okay, uh, 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 Michael and then Guy. Well, please, Guy, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead <clears throat> My question is about the, um, the tip expenditures. Um, you can see the top uh, 10... Um, fiscal Six. year so top top sixteen expenditures, um, w as it relates to the sponsorship of the festivals, and this may be a question for another time. It may not be related to the um, discussion about the audit. Yes. But uh, I guess my question is, what metrics are used to determine, or do you know, um, to determine the appropriate amount that a festival will be sponsored? <clears throat> yes. And how is it related <coughs> to the econo economic impact of that festival, or to the importance of the festival to our uh, to our culture and heritage in Virginia Beach. For example, I'm not, I'm not going to name them, but I see some festivals that um, are notable to me that are not on this list. And also, um, I just wonder um, how, as I mentioned again, the economic impact relates to sponsorship. I'll give a first attempt, and I don't know if Ron uh, Coleman would, would want to respond as well. But it is based on a ROI, return on investment, and there is a application, there is a formula based on the uh, amount of revenue that is being brought into the city, uh, helps determine and factors into the amount of sponsorship an organization will actually receive. And we have looked at that in uh, previous years to ensure that if they're promising certain amounts and, and, and the city is granting a sponsorship, those metrics are in fact actually being met. So there is a, uh, there is a formula, there is an application that kind of gets into detail and it's not just an arbitrary dollar amount. You know, you get 25, you get 30, you get 10. 
um, but it is based on a ROI return on investment. Ron, is that just That's accurate? accurate? <clears throat> okay. Would, could I just follow up on that to say that um, if it would be possible, if you could share that information with me, I would be very interested in learning more about Absolutely. that um, process and about those metrics. Okay. Yeah, thank we you. can get. We can certainly get that. Okay, Guy. I had a uh, thank you, Lyndon. I had a question from a little more of a thirty thousand foot sure. perspective. Your when you were, your basic um, decision that <clears throat> expenditures of the funds were appropriate. Yes. Um, do you go by anything other than this language on slide four that says they are funding for tourism-related capital projects and initiatives? Is that your, um, is your yeah. guidance is, is more detailed than that? Could you um, at, at a high level, that that is, but we also drill down and we do look, you know, we, we're looking at the descriptions of is it related, is it tourism related initiative or supporting that? Um, and is it specifically, you know, going to benefit uh, beach operations if it's a vehicle or if it is a um, equipment? Um, but there are things that may not necessarily be direct, but indirect, like, you know, like some of the abacus spending, some of the cleanup, uh, you know, some of the manual, manual labor. So if it is a uh, initiative, and, and a lot of this we do rely on, and we also uh, review, the department, when they are managing their expenses, they have to have a certain level of control because they're the ones actually coding against the tip and the tap funds, particularly the tip, because there are uh, uh, various departments that actually have tip funds uh, public Works, Parks and Rec, uh, you know, so there's other different departments that are hitting, hitting it. So we look at the controls they have to, in fact, ensure if a expenditure is hitting the TIP fund, it does meet that criteria. I guess, and again, pulling back to the 30000 again, and this is because I'm kind of new to this, do, when the expenditures, do we know at the end of the budget process with exactitude, how much of every budget amount is going to be tip, you know, uh, revenue is going to be tip oriented. So, I mean, is, are you relying on council's imprimatur, I guess, of what is a tourism related project? Or is it a department? I mean, that, that is, that is you know, the ordinances kind of give a broad uh, definition of. You, tourism, I guess it could be open to uh, in, interpretation, but when we did look at it, we, we did give it some scrut scrutiny, and if it was something, you know, for example, like the Hilton or of what is this, is it actually related, how is it related, um, so we did provide that scrutiny, but there isn't anything that says it has to be this, 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 and this. Uh, but if it is a actual initiative or an expenditure supporting an initiative, then we deemed it appropriate. Thank you. Barbara. Just along that line, for many years, uh, I recall that councils have had a policy that if we were going to put anything in the budget, we had to, at the time we put it in, identify how it was going to be paid for. And so I guess oftentimes that's where it comes for you to determine if, in fact, we are doing what the intent was when it was begun. For example, if we were going to do the dome project, as a part of saying, yes, we're going to do the dome project, we have to identify how it's going to be paid for. And I think that's been the policy that we've had for anything, that you have to, we have to know how it's going to be paid for if we're going to say we're going to do this. I think it's been a, been pretty effective because if there's no, I mean, if we haven't identified how it was going to be paid for, we don't approve it. Funding source. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so we can go. <clears throat> all right, so the, so the second piece, and this was in um, 
This was in the memo that, a separate memo that you should have received in your Friday packet uh, dated November 22nd. Um, and this was related to our review of the Longwoods International Estimated Visitor Spending. And, and some of you may be familiar with this. Um, okay. So during the course of the audit, uh, an issue related to a TAP expenditure, which is the Longwoods um, International Estimated Visitor Spending Report, which is paid out of TAP. I think they uh, pay annually $25,000. We started using under the former director, I believe the first report we got was for calendar year 2017. Second one we got was for 2018. So it's only two years worth of data, okay? Uh, but the issue was, <clears throat> okay, so just some background information. So Longwoods International, or we refer to it as Longwoods, is a marketing research consulting firm which focuses on the analysis of the travel and tourism industry. City began using Longwoods in 2017 to, uh, perform visitor research. As part of the research, Longwoods provides estimates of domestic overnight spending to include lodging, transportation, recreation, retail, and restaurant food. Um, their numbers, it should be pointed out, um, are only domestic and do not include international visitor spending. And as we know, we, we have visitors uh, outside of the U.S., Canada, China, um, and, and, and so forth, okay? But their numbers only included domestic, okay? All right, so estimated tourism impact amounts overstated by millions. Basically, that's, that's our finding, okay? Um, and this is a common statement that you will see the city has been utilizing um, in various press releases, advertisements, uh, and, and so forth. The travel and tourism industry is a major economic driver for our city. More than 19 million visitors choose Virginia Beach over all other destinations. Uh, those visitors contributed $2.45 in direct spending to local businesses. Okay. So the issue we had was, and we heard from uh, several you know, citizens as well, is that $2.45 billion um, sounds like a lot. Where'd that number come from? Where'd the $2.45 billion come from? Okay. So basically, it came from Longwood's study, all right? And as, as you can see, they came up with total uh, lodging, spending, that included lodging, transportation, recreation, retail. Um, and then they ca came up with domestic day spending. So overnight spending, day spending. So if you add up the 1.92 and the 539 from their charts, that's where you come up with the 2.4 billion. If you wanted to round it up correctly, it would probably 2.5 billion, right? But, but the number that we wanted to kind of focus on which is on the next slide, okay, is the lodging. Okay, so of that 2.4 billion, uh, 889 million of that they attributed to lodging. And so the reason we were saying that is overstated is because of all the expenses that they have on the chart. At the time they're preparing their estimate, the one, one of the amounts that is actually known is lodging taxes collected, okay? Because that's, you can get that number from the commissioner of revenue, the taxes collected, okay? So on the next slide, we just do a comparison. So the Longwoods has 889 million, okay? Based on the hotel taxes collected, remitted to the Commissioner of Revenue, 
right, we can back into the estimated lodging tax receipts from the city, you know. So based on that, we're calculating you know, approximately 359 million. They have it at 889 million. And remember, they're only including domestic. If we added, if they added, uh, Longwood's added international, the gap would even be larger. So all we're saying is, so the variance is, is close to $529 million, okay? Um, and we did meet, and Ron, Ron uh, Coleman, uh, you know, should be commended for when Longwoods came in to present their 2018 numbers um, and they went through it, we actually had the opportunity to meet with the uh, senior vice president of research and asked them, what was your methodology? How are you coming up with the 889 for 17? How are you coming up with 2018 for uh, 944 million? And basically, it is self-reported, right? A random sample of, of uh, individuals that may have visited Virginia Beach, um, they're self-reporting. And when you're self-reporting, you're ripe for error because they can include parking, valet, their meals, uh, if they went whale watching and that was on their bill. You know, so who knows what number they're reporting uh, but the point is, you know, and we, we know it's an estimate, and no one would be having any issues if it was, you know, X percentage off. But when we're off that dollar amount and, and the fact that we know what the uh, lodging receipts are, okay? So um, basically they said it's an estimate. It could be modified, the methodology. Uh, so we're working with the vendor to actually modify that methodology. And he said, you know, we paid him more and we wanted to do a deeper dive. Maybe we could get a better number. Or they actually suggested, well, why don't you just use what the commissioner revenue has? And then we don't have to worry about a variance. So that's another way to, to go about it. All right, so when we're talking about the $2.45 billion, you know, like, so what? Is anybody actually using the $2.45 billion when we're touting out there? It's just an estimate. Is anybody actually making any decisions off of it? You know, so it is included, and I list in the report, you know, it's in the city council legislative agenda package. Uh, it is, it's in the city manager's update. It's in the bond preliminary official statements for stormwater, the GOB, GOP bonds. So the number is being quoted in some official documents. And if we are going to use that number out there, we do want, again, it's an estimate, but we do want to see if we can get an actual better estimate. Okay? All right, so... Um, and just slide back, all right, so at the bottom, and that's what we state at the bottom, due to the fact that the $2.45 billion in direct spending figure is reported widely, used by a lot of different users, as well as residents, the inaccurate spending numbers could lead to some misinformed business decision. So to me, that's the so what. Okay, so what if we put $2.45 billion, $1.6 billion, okay, it could have an impact. All right, so the recommendations, and we went over this with, with management, um, refrain from citing Longwood's international tourism impact figures until the methodology for computing direct spending has been modified. So you, you'll notice you, you haven't seen anything in regards to the 2018 numbers, okay? Because Ron agreed that we, we, should, we shouldn't use it until we get a better, uh, we get a better number. Uh, Review for the reasonableness and accuracy of any direct spending impacts performed by outside consultants. And when numbers don't appear to be reasonable, right, ask them about the methodology. And there is a work group currently actually trying to address this issue to see what should be the methodology. Should we continue using Longwood? Should we go back and to, to another method? Um, but come up with something that at least we can feel comfortable with the numbers. And then no matter what methodology we use, understand the soundness of the methodology used by the consultants to compute direct spending, because it is a number we all want to tout. And no doubt tourism is big and does have an impact, but we don't want to overstate it um, unnecessarily, okay? 
All right. Jim, then Rosemary. So, and, and Flynn, I appreciate the, the analysis you've done here. This is probably more of a question for the manager. Um, so when a, when a consultant comes in and is off by my calculation, <coughs> 50% in their, in their estimates for two years in a row, it seems to me that, that that's probably an issue in the performance of that contract. Are we, are we taking the appropriate steps with that vendor to make sure that, I don't know, terminate the relationship, re recover, anything like that? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we've met with the vendor, and I, and I know Ron is working with them, and the vendor is actually open to changing the methodology. He was pretty straightforward and upfront and said, this is what we're doing. It's all self-reported. It's ripe for errors. If you want a deeper dive, you know, you can pay more. Uh, we can change but, but, it. But so. the fact of the matter is, is, is yes. this vendor is holding this out as accurate information. We're accepting it as accurate information, and it's 150% off. It's half a billion dollars off. Which is which is significant. Well, maybe it's not. There's a half a billion dollars difference between what we can prove and what they state. So, so I think I think that that's critical. And and frankly, that means to me that what what we've received is is not what we've paid for. And that's my question. As as Lyndon indicated, Ron Williams and Convention and Visitors Bureau are looking at that uh, okay. certainly before we uh, uh, use this uh, service any more than we have. We will. Uh, either figure out what the difference is and whether there's an explanation or maybe it's to stop using that service. Okay, thanks. Okay, Rosemary. <clears throat> My question was a little bit like Jim's. What, what did we pay for this study? It was, we paid 25000 annually. Is that, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's correct. It was uh, $20,000 over a two year period, so it was 20000 20, a year. 20000 a year. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I think we ought to look at alternatives to. I mean, it's, this is crazy. I mean, it's a crazy gap. I mean, we could understand it if it was a yeah, little bit. Yeah, 5%, off. 2%, 3%. You know, but this much is just, it's not, it's unreliable. It's very unreliable, and, and it's going on our documents, and we're making decisions, and, and also people who want to invest in our city are probably making decisions on these numbers. So I think we definitely need to... Look at changing vendors, and uh, I would be embarrassed if I was Longwoods. Okay. Jessica. Is, uh, is that agreement something that was executed by council, or is it an agreement the city manager has the authority to execute? I believe for, for that dollar amount, the, the former director uh, made that decision to utilize uh, Convention and okay. Visitors yeah. Bureau. It would probably be a line item in their budget, and when you approve the budget, then they had the authority to execute the contract. They did indicate that a number of other jurisdictions use this, and they do compare their numbers to the other jurisdictions, uh, and that there is some value of that comparison. But again, the, we need to explain these differences or stop using this firm. The other numbers that are reported in that study, is there a way for us to check those with yeah, the, uh, there are, I believe, it's like a direct trustee tax, probably like the meal tax, but the retail, uh, their, you know, how they describe their amusement ver versus our amusement. Um, so I think the, the, the work group that has been formed, I think they're going to actually look deeper into uh, the other categories. But your audit did not. No, my our audit did not. We were able to look at oh, the uh, to, to launching. Yes. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, Sabrina. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the 19 million visitors that are estimated that visit Virginia yes. Beach. Is that an accurate number? Yes. So that is a number that has also been questioned because it does tie back into the methodology. We did not look at that, but they do go hand in hand because it's the same methodology utilized in estimating some of these expenditures uh, as well as it's tied in directly to the amount of visitors. So that has been questioned. We didn't look at that. Um, it does look, you know, in relatively high, but I can't say if it's how high or, or, or if it's inaccurate because we didn't, we didn't look at that. But I'm assuming it's the same type of methodology. 
and I wouldn't be surprised if it was off, but we didn't look into it. I'm, I'm concerned that that number is off, especially with um, the expenditures that, you know, and the other information that's misquoted. And so I'm concerned about that, and I'm concerned that that number could be a misrepresentation for our city as well. Um, so I don't know how we could go about finding an accurate number, but if 19 million is not accurate, Yes, and I think as part of the, the, the work group, that probably can be uh, ad addressed as well because they're looking at the entire Longwoods uh, report. I would like to see if that is an accurate number because that has been brought to my attention as well. Okay. But thank you for your assistance. Okay. Okay, anybody else? I just had a follow-up question. Yeah. Do we know, did they use, when Longwoods does their, their analysis, do they use actual consumer data like credit card data that shows where these transactions are taking place or anything like that? Not, for, not for the estimate. The estimate, basically, they told us is, is self-reported, you know, uh, a random number of users are selected, and they go online, and then they're reporting. So how do they pick who they're polling? <clears throat> um... I know it's a random sample of, but as far as the sample, how the sample was formed or what they're pulling from, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure on that. Just, I mean, it, if the work group's working on it, just whenever they brief us, I'd be interested in knowing what the methodology of how they're getting their data, and then it would be interesting to know if the work group's not already working on this what is best practices for trying to derive this information. Yes. Um, and have that comparison whenever we're briefed on it. That would okay. be helpful. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, and before I, I close, Mayor, I do want to thank Kevin Cabasa for his help uh, from finance, uh, Kevin Chandelier from uh, management services, Tim Bell from my office, Ron has, has been very um, helpful and you know, we do want to, you know, as, as the interim director of CVB, I'm sure, you know, he's just as concerned and wants to make sure we have accurate numbers and uh, Rosanna Clark from my office for her assistance as well. well. I just want to thank you because your department, along in conjunction with the other folks that worked on this, you know, really ensure the public trust by bringing this stuff forward, you know, so that we could rectify it. And I think it goes a long way to showing the transparency that we have. And thank you very much. Uh, you know, once again, uh, stellar job, stellar reputation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, council, we'll get uh, uh, set up um, for our next presentation. Um, we have uh, guests from uh, uh, Dominion Energy and Virginia Tech uh, joining. What was that? What was that? Dominion Energy. Tech. Oh, I didn't hear you. What he said that other fine. Oh, okay. I didn't. I the thought Dominion said, Energy. So one of the. Said, yeah, with Virginia Beach and. Uh, you know, I, didn't, I didn't hear that part. One of several <laughs> fine engineering schools okay, in the state. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> and so. Um, uh, <coughs> it's got a whole group kit. What did you say? Welcome. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. I just. Max, long like, time no like see. <laughs> so we have Brian Solis uh, uh, from my office, and I'm going to let Brian, you can introduce Max, and I think Max will introduce his uh, uh, teammates, and you can introduce uh, our guests from Virginia Tech. Yes, sir, will do. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Stiles, thanks for uh, having us here today to talk about an exciting opportunity. Uh, and together with um, our folks from Domain Energy, I will let Max uh, Bartholomew, uh, a lot of you uh, know him as our uh, kind of representative for our, our region for Dominion Energy, uh, introduce his, uh, a lot of his team you have here, if, if you don't mind, Max. Sure. So. Uh, I'm Troy Lindsay. He's on our external affairs staff. Benita Harris, who's our television celebrity, or where she goes, she's our media manager. We got uh, Julie. Julie here. She's yeah. a Dominion employee, and the gentleman there is with yeah. Virginia Tech Transportation. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so Julie Manzari is actually with the Innovation Group with Domain Energy, and um, we've interacted along with other city staff and smart cities type of initiatives around the country and mostly around Virginia, and she'll be um, taking the second part of this briefing. Um, Mr. Reginald Verre, he goes by Reg, Verre is with Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, but he's based out of Virginia Beach. He's kind of a uh, local, regional, state, and on some levels national, uh, connected and automated vehicle um, researcher. Um, we have Deb Bryan. Uh, Deborah Bryan is, has been on uh, some governor's uh, committees related to smart cities uh, initiatives. We have uh, Chris Russell is also here from Domain Energy. Um, Rick Lowman is your traffic engineer. And Frank Hickman is your operations engineer from Public Works. And I'll talk about uh, some of the initiatives that um, your Public Works Department has been advancing for decades now uh, in the field of what we call intelligent transportation systems, ITS. So, um, again, this partnership kind of, this, this collaboration, uh, it's not a partnership yet, but this collaboration has um, kind of coalesced through uh, the series of uh, meetings that we have related to smart cities initiatives. And you might hear the term smart cities or smart regions around the country and even internationally. And that has to do with basically uh, improving public service delivery through the use of technology and innovation, basically. And this is an opportunity to do so in terms of uh, trying to create as safe and as efficient of a transportation system for your residents and your visitors as possible. And this potential demonstration project is a very a small but important incremental step towards getting us that way. So these are um, some, some previous basically council goals. Um, this one was related to transportation. And you have um, had on there uh, for us to you know, consider becoming a, a test center for emerging technology and uh, transportation. And again, over the years, your public works department has created the traffic management center, has with your uh, information technology department, um, has put below the road and in your traffic signals, um, all kinds of technology infrastructure that readies us to be a connected, uh, basically vehicle test bed, and also to be eligible for automated vehicles as well. So. Um, Reg is really going to get into what does that mean, and it's essentially uh, vehicles talking to the infrastructure and back. And again, the whole point is to try to be safer and more efficient. So uh, in terms of the demonstra uh, demonstration project overview, what we're looking at uh, doing is um, working with Domain Energy. They have a similar type of demonstration project that is in the development stages in the Mosaic District of Fairfax County, Northern Virginia. Um, who would potentially you know, procure the vehicles either by lease or purchase and also um, provide the service, the stewards, to uh, be in the vehicle uh, while it's in operations to take over as needed. Um, VTTI, Virginia Tech, you know, would do the analytics. Um, they would work with Dominion and the city to equip the vehicles with um, equipment that gathers data both on uh, vehicle behavior as well as pedestrian bicyclist um, behavior um, and, and help us with those analytics in determining how effective this demonstration project is. The city uh, would be responsible for uh, basically providing a corridor or a circuit, a very simple one, that uh, is in a state of good repair and that means that the pavement's relatively even, the markings are very um, legible uh, for the vehicle and that the signage is in accordance with uh, basically uh, national standards. Um, so when we're looking at a route criteria, we're, we're, this is something that's relatively short distance as a demonstration project. You may have heard the term first mile, last mile. This truly is seeking to be, you know, uh, really a mile or so uh, one way uh, distance or a simple circuit that is more of a uh, rectangle or square, something that minimizes his turns, especially left turns across traffic. Um, something, an area that the city or the partners have rights to use. For example, um, if we meandered on as a stop for this vehicle, a private site that we have right of entry or identification for the vehicle to be on that property. So we would look at as simple of a ownership scenario as possible. And again, that state of good repair for the route is important for the vehicle to be able to uh, function optimally. 
Um, so those are our roles. And then at the end, um, we'll, we'll kind of get into next steps, and I'll come back in to talk about that. So I believe Tara Real has, has briefed this portion to you before when the council has been briefed on the comprehensive plan. And your comprehensive plan does talk about uh, trying to advance us uh, into the intelligent uh, transportation systems, ITS world, um, through connected vehicles and automated vehicle technology. <coughs> so this is the scale that you may hear about if you ever to, to read an article or material about automated vehicles. And um, with zero being, you know, your, your older vehicles uh, prior to 1995-ish or uh, 2005-ish, uh, where some of this automation started to come into mainstream uh, consumer vehicle use. And uh, going all the way to full automation, and we believe that the potential demonstration project is somewhere between a three and a four in terms of conditional automation and high automation, um, depending on what kind of vehicle we end up with and what kind of demonstration project. And all of this is, is obviously couched on uh, support from council and, and moving forward with the next step of developing this potential uh, project. So, um, Tara came up with this slide and it's basically showing you where in terms of uh, CAV is connected in automated vehicle, uh, bless you, technology maturity. And we're basically in the, um, in terms of at the state level, um, building and developing test tracks. And uh, Mr. Verre will, will, will talk about what Virginia Tech has done in creating a smart road and smart, basically, almost community to test out um, these automated and connected vehicles. And so we're kind of in the, still the development stage, and, and we hope to um, also be able to partner with the state in terms of um, funding for uh, the city and all the partners sides of this project. So we are looking at grant opportunities um, for this. Um, with that, I'd like to you know, introduce and, and call up uh, Ms. Julie uh, Manzari. She came down from Richmond today and uh, drove her electric vehicle and we have it charging uh, across the street at, uh, at our EV uh, charging station. And ag again, um, Julie operates in the smart city space for Dominion Energy and their innovation group. So, good, Julie. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Can you, is this working? Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk with you all today, uh, particularly about innovation and autonomous electric vehicles. These are some of my favorite things. Uh, so Dominion Energy is committed to being a driver of change and to supporting uh, innovative projects that enhance sustainability for in both all of our service territories, business areas, as well as our customers. Um, and we believe that autonomous electric vehicles are a path to both sustainable and uh, efficient solutions uh, for our customers and in our service territories. Um, so one of the things, I just want to kind of focus you all on uh, Dominion's commitment to building a more sustainable future for both our planet, our communities, and our customers. Uh, we're really focused on environmental responsibility, our customer focus, and if you think about it in the context of what we've done um, with our electric grid to date, we've done <coughs> put a lot of efforts in uh, clean energy uh, and sustainable energy on our, on our grid. We have further targets in 2030 and 2050 to further enhance <coughs> low emission, uh, low carbon uh, electrical grid. Uh, we also understand that uh, things are changing very rapidly in the marketplace, and that includes uh, not only technology, but how our customers uh, perceive technology <coughs> and what they are expecting us to be and do, and then also how markets might interact. And this is something that's led us to, particularly the transportation industry. Recently, the transportation industry has become the number one carbon emitter in uh, the United States, and it's significantly higher in the state of Virginia. Um, so, uh, because of electrification of transportation and our view of this being a more sustainable solution, we've taken a much deeper look into what's happening in the transportation sector, particularly because we believe that electrification is gonna be a big deal in the future. And I'm an example of that. I'm charging my vehicle here today. 
Um, but there's a lot of activity that's occurring here that's going to affect not only our customers, but also your citizens around the fact that uh, people today believe that uh, transportation can be a shared asset. So uh, opportunities like ride hailing, car sharing, there's a lot of um, changes in the market that are happening due to technology enhancements. In addition, uh, we also are seeing that uh, there's a lot of technology advancements in autonomy, which uh, Brian had also talked about. And then as well as these vehicles are anticipated to be more and more connected. A perfect example of this is uh, vehicles now have software. They get those software updates over the air. So all of these things and the rate of change in which that's happening, the transportation industry is changing very quickly. And we see that not only electrification, but autonomy is going to be a big part of that. The way we approach innovative solutions is uh, what we're looking for is to follow these markets and these trends and start by working with our customers in particularly uh, projects like a demonstration project that helps us and you understand what the benefits of the technology are and what a good way to actually deploy that technology would be. So uh, you all might not know all of our history, um, but at one point in time, uh, Dominion actually uh, owned the Electric Street Rail Company in Richmond. So we call this our Back to the Future project. Um, that was in the early 1900s. Uh, we are a public service entity and we're well positioned to decarbonize the transportation industry. We also uh, are very supportive of the benefits of electrification, not only for low carbon solutions, but also local emissions uh, that you get from electrification. Uh, and then lastly, the benefits of autonomy um, are assume to be related to safety, efficiency, and I think there will be more to come that we have not yet realized. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And Thank you, Julie. And we're all will be available for council discussion and questions at the end, or if you feel free to ask along the way. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Reg uh, Varey, again, from Virginia Tech Transportation Institute, but he's employed here in the city of Virginia Beach. And I first met um, Mr. Varey at Fairfax County, was hosting, and this was a couple years ago, an automated and connected vehicle type of uh, demonstration uh, conference. And he was a subject matter expert on a panel uh, speaking there. So with that, I'll turn it over to Reg. Awesome. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you guys very much. It's truly an honor to be here, uh, being born and raised in Virginia Beach and going through the Virginia Beach City Public School System. It's really great to be back here and help bring a type of technology to my home. Um, now that I think about it, actually the last time I was probably in this building, I was a student at North Landing Elementary touring this building. So it's great to be in front of you guys now giving a demonstration. So this is really great. Um, That's so yeah. um, so in VTTI, really what I'm going to go over with my presentation is to go over the many assets and capabilities that we have and some of the research at a high level of uh, what has been performed to basically change uh, policy when it comes from a local level, a state level, a national level, and even in some cases a uh, uh, international level with some of the technology we've done and some of the research. Um, some things that may kind of stand out was with our research projects, we've been able to quantify the risk, obviously, with driving and texting from some of the research studies we've done. So that changed a lot of uh, policy that way um, as well. So VTTI really is the largest group of active safety researchers in the country. We have over 500 employees studying topics from asphalt all the way down to automated and connected vehicles, uh, which makes essentially the number one transportation institute um, in the country. Um, so really at Virginia Tech, what's really driven our growth and what's really proved some of the research and uh, the new technology is our smart road down in Blacksburg, Virginia. It's a 2.2 mile track that has ability to um, create all different types of weather scenarios, lighting scenarios, and of that nature. And in addition, we've kind of grown it to, to include an urban tract and also a rural tract to test new automated vehicle systems. Um, there's over 30,000 hours of research that was done on this test tract and a lot of the technologies that you see in your cars today and stuff that you'll see in the future have and are currently being tested on this test track as well. Um, so this environment is private. Uh, it allows us to do research studies in a controlled environment to ensure the safety of drivers and really get down to the details and 
the type of actions and reactions they do when being exposed to new technologies. So really the crux of it all is a vehicle integration, our ability to integrate all sorts of vehicles, let it be motorcycles, trucks, to automated vehicles. Uh, we connect to the network on the vehicles um, that has camera systems we also include, and essentially a black box to do data acquisition. Um, they're very obscure in how we instrument them so that when a driver takes place in them, they drive, start driving naturalistically and we start seeing their true behaviors after a certain amount of time. Um, so we have the ability to do that and this has a capability to connect from connected vehicles, automated vehicles, into new uh, vehicles that we see today. Um, as Brian mentioned, some of the work that I've done up in the Northern Virginia region was to implement the Virginia Connected Corridors. Um, in Fairfax, we instrumented over 30 intersection lights to provide signal phase and timing. Essentially what that means is you get a digital message from out of line of sight of what's the green arrow, if it's gonna be red, a stop, and the time that you have left. Um, this type of data that's sent from the vehicle and the vehicle back to the infrastructure allows to enable applications like this to let the driver know that you could drive at 30 miles per hour to make the green light, or if it's a red light, when to stop ahead of time. Uh, so this is really important for automated vehicles because with the current sensor packages in automated vehicles, they have a really tough time going through certain intersections. If they're able to communicate with the infrastructure, know the timing of the light, know if there's another vehicle coming from the side, um, then the automated vehicle can make the correct decision and safely traverse the intersection um, if necessary. When it really comes down to it, this is the work I really do and I love is down to the vehicle data. Um, this is the information we collect from this data from time to end to end. We have the ability to look at speed, speed limits, acceleration, yaw rate, lots of little details uh, to get down to what the driver is doing. Um, some of the research projects we've done, uh, over thousands of vehicles, we let drivers drive naturalistically and what we find are case examples of perfect driving behaviors and also really bad driving behaviors. The great thing about data and our ability to collect it is this essentially becomes a memory of sorts. If an automated vehicle is exposed to a bad situation and can learn from it, from a true driver, then the system overall continues to learn and that's a topic with data is if it learns it or sees it once and it applies it to the fleet, the whole vehicle fleet understands what's happening. So it's kind of this group cloud mind of memory that they could always refer back to and not make the same mistake like humans would do. Some of the tools that we have, um, we have full 360 view of what's happening outside of the vehicle. As Brian alluded to, we would instrument the automated vehicle to see what's going on inside with the potential passengers. Um, but more importantly, external environment and how people react towards it, let it be pedestrians or other drivers. Um, with that, we could replay this video and its information to understand exactly what the nuance is that's occurring with the driver and the environment around it. If you click, it'll play it first. Oh, okay. Oh, perfect. So, it just kind of show the overall 360 view where we have uh, of the data reductionists that we have at VTTI. They look through these videos. Essentially, how that would work is I'd write some code and algorithm to find a certain use case in your crash scenario or an intersection traversal, and they would look at it and really verify what's happening to understand the nuances and the details behind uh, certain crash events and to verify it as well, too, and to see what the driver's doing. Um, as alluded to before, um, a lot of the stuff we did with texting and driving was seen from this so we could see how much time they looked off the road and what's happening outside the road too. Then obviously with automated vehicles, God knows what people are gonna do. So the more information we have, um, we, the more recommendations we can make and there are different types of technologies we can implement to make it even safer. So research grant opportunities, uh, with VTTI, we currently have two that we house within the university or within our Transportation Institute. It's our safety one, uh, our National University Safety Through Disruption Program, as well as our National Surface Transportation Safety Center of Excellence, uh, both of which I have grants for right now, and we currently have one with the City of Virginia Beach working with Brian and Tara Real on utilizing uh, real-time data of intersection cameras, for example, to detect um, safety situations. So these are two potential funding opportunities uh, that we could utilize to help fund potentially this type of project and we could use a leverage as well. And not to mention other USDOT funds that are out there as well uh, that we could look into. So that, that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Veray. And um, as we wind down and stand ready for council discussion, kind of wanted to offer some next steps for consideration. Uh, so we would look at the criteria that was, I guess on slide, uh, 
slide three, you know, evaluate some potential route options uh, with that criteria, very general uh, criteria that I uh, described earlier. Um, we would need to identify the route and equipment needs on the city's end in terms of um, are there any markings or a corridor that's selected for the demonstration project? Are there any markings or signage uh, that are needed to get the roadway into a state of good repair? And then uh, what kind of equipment is needed within the traffic signals to be able to speak to the vehicle and the vehicle back um, to receive that information? The opportunity that if given kind of a nod to, to proceed here, uh, that we would come back to you would be with a draft MOU, MA, MOA terms, Memorandum of Agreement terms that uh, Deborah Bryan is working on with uh, Dominion's um, attorney. And uh, to brief you on those and to get uh, your feedback on those uh, moving forward, uh, parallel with that or right after that, we would uh, really look into some um, funding opportunities for any improvements that are needed on the city side or also to, to aid in the um, implementation of research uh, with uh, VTTI and Dominion, um, as well as um, working uh, through this program in education and outreach. So Mr. Veray talked about um, what they learned from the observations with the vehicles. We would like um, collectively um, through the, the three uh, partnership, uh, partnership to um, have a community outreach and education program um, about um, all aspects of, of the program. And then uh, phased implementation. So um, we believe we definitely want to crawl uh, before we walk and run with um, automation and connected vehicles. And so we are looking at a, you know, uh, the routes that we would look at would be very modest in terms of their length, uh, very simple, low speed, uh, low um, average daily traffic um, to really reduce the risk and really be able to uh, manage the program in a, in a very sustainable way. And then, of course, in, a, in addition to um, uh, outreach and education, uh, monitor the program and report out the findings um, to you periodically. So um, those are our next steps we're recommending and are open to any feedback you have. Um, our in-house expert is uh, out of town for the holidays, Tara Real. She also went to Virginia Tech to get uh, two uh, graduate um, degrees and also was a researcher at VTTI as well, and she helped you know, develop the relationship with them. So stand by for any questions you okay, have. Okay, Rosemary. Well, <clears throat> it's very exciting. Um, so are you all doing this in other localities in the state? or? Yes, so on the uh, Smart Road and also working with uh, Fairfax County as well to a certain degree, uh, Dominion as well. So, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I'm glad that you have chosen Virginia Beach to be part of this. It's, it's very exciting. Okay, the gentleman from Virginia Tech and then Jess. i got a question, Mr. Ray. Um, with this vehicle data going on, how are you all keeping the, the privacy um, safe um, with everything that you're learning, not only from um, a security measure from hackers, but also from an economic measure from, say, an insurance company using, say, um, a tool to develop um, some kind of a parameter to say, well, drivers between these ages are more than likely to speed or have bad driving behaviors and in return raise up prices and things like that. But all the data you're capturing, how are you keeping it? Right, perfect question. So the thing about VTTI is with the university, we go through a, uh, basically a research board that looks over at basically an IRB, which basically confines us to keep this stuff secure and only focus to the research project uh, that we're working on. So the information that we do have, we don't sell to people per se. We don't cut it up and slice and then sell this information about uh, certain groups or of that nature. So it's all protected by the university uh, research board as well there that keeps that. Um, what we do know is we look at these research projects at a high level, but provide information to insurance agencies, for example, or certain like NHTSA, uh, the US DOT, about safety risk as well. So really what we do with the data is more for the betterment of safety and just general overall good use of information. So really uh, with the university, it's it's more of a, uh, it's a public entity, uh, so it's a nonprofit as well too. So really what we're trying to do is just drive the betterment of safety uh, overall. Okay, Jess and John. Um, Could you get up to, uh, to the microphone? It might be better this way. You know, the public can hear you a little better. Yeah. Sure thing. Can you do you guys collaborate with um, 
like the highway safety question, or with question. the insurance companies? Because obviously the insurance companies have their own measure of collecting their data. Um, State Farm has the drive safe and safe. Progressive has the, I can't remember what it's called. They all have the little thing that Bluetooth to your phone and aggregates the data, gives you a grade. Currently is supposedly not rating you, but will probably one day. So are, is the data you're using to calculate this information, do you collaborate with them in terms of trying to get their data, or do you strictly stay with your the data you guys have created? Exactly. It's basically the data that we create, <laughs> the vehicles that we instrument uh, exactly, as long as it's covered under the IRB, uh, the research board. That's pretty much the domain that we like to work in um, as well. So. Okay. And then um, for the testing place, is it, are you all looking for a active road so these vehicles are integrated with current traffic patterns or are you looking for, I, would, would the ideal thing to be something completely separate? So, so we are uh, looking at integrated or mixed traffic for this demonstration project. That's why we recommend that it be a uh, low traffic road, um, that it be a limited stretch, that it be in a state of good repair. That's investment is already taking place in to get it to that point. And so that's why we want to take a small measured approach because this, this would be uh, mixed traffic. So in order to do that, um, there would be an application to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, uh, NHTSA, for what's called a waiver. And that's how the federal government uh, manages applications for proposed automated vehicle use in a mixed use environment. Mm -hmm. So it would be mixed traffic. Kind of a comment to the body. I, I think this is very exciting. It was something that was on one of the first letters I wrote to this body when I first got on council about trying to get us to be a testing place for this kind of technology because I really do believe it's the future. I'll also just add, Virginia Beach pays some of the highest premiums in, in, in auto insurance in the state and in and, and the country as a whole. Um, we're like 101 worth city to drive in. So I think not only is there an economic benefit for just progressing this technology, but you want to talk about actual cost savings in immediate pockets. It, the, this is the future of the insurance industry, and it will greatly reduce the cost of driving. Getting Good. our drivers off the road. <laughs> Got to watch those Jersey drivers, too. Hey, John? Well, I guess my question is to the staff and to the city attorney. I just need to, once again... Fuller and Dominion, I just like to get a written, secure written opinion as to, given the terms of the agreement, what that is. But can I comment on just scientific information <coughs> independent of this proposal? Until there's been a determination of whether or not you may participate based on the agreement, I would suggest that you not. Right. I'll submit my comments to you, and you can submit them to Collins, either permissible, because there's some scientific uh, overstatements here. Thank you. Hey, anybody else? Yeah, Byron. Last but certainly not least, um, just a, a story I want to share with you all with Dominion um, did this past week here in, uh, in the historic SeaTac community. I know you all may have seen on the news the Cook Redskins have, uh, uh, have experienced a terrible ordeal. Somebody ransacked and vandalized their equipment. And before I, I could even pick up my phone, Miss Bonita Harris, as well as um, Dave and Troy over there, they they all showed up and presented them a, um, a check for $5,000 to wow. help them secure them to get them to Florida, um, as well as Charles Barker, um, Champion for Kids Foundation. Um, but they three actually showed up. So I think, again, it's, it's comforting to see that we here we are talking about what makes our city better, but we actually have organizations such as Dominion Power um, care about the community and invest the community. It, it goes a long way. So no, thank you. Good stuff. Council as well. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know, it wasn't that long ago. You know, when I was in grad school, and I had this wonderful device called the beeper, and it was letting me know somebody was trying to call me. I could stop at a gas station and for a dime use a payphone and get in, who was trying to get in touch with me. But take a look at the technology we have in our cars right now you know, just with GPSs and everything. This may th seem Jetsons to some people, but don't be surprised if this stuff moves rather quickly. And then, you know, within the foreseeable future, you know, we're seeing this. You know, technology is expanding, you know, you know, exponentially. I have one last question for Ray from Virginia Tech. Can you get us an um, update? I know Virginia Tech is doing a study on scooters 
um, on the implementation of scooters on campus. I mm -hmm. uh, wonder if you have an update or where you are on that, or at least you can, you can send that to me as well. I'd like to see how we are implementing that throughout campus. Right. I can point you to the right direction. I did look at some data. I had to kind of went through my uh, yeah. computer for a little bit. So okay. I did work through that. Get, get all right, thank you. I'd love to see that. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman, Councilman Rouse, uh, we'll work with uh, Mr. Vare to get, uh, I guess, the status of their research with uh, the program they have with SPIN. Um, I believe that's the company that they're using uh, so far. I know they just started it in fall semester, but we'll, we'll get you, I guess, a status update on that, and we'll get it to all of council. So, that's great. Sorry, guys, uh, forgot to mention over to you. Uh, so I know it's relatively short notice, but uh, VTTI, Virtue Tech Transportation Institute, is hosting an actual automated, low-speed automated vehicle workshop on December 3rd. So I know it's short notice. It's next week, uh, but we are playing that. So please let me know if there's any interest, if anyone wants to drive down to the Berg. Thanks a bunch and appreciate a great presentation by all. Thank you. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, do we, and uh, Mr. Manager, do we... Um, have a general go ahead to come back with you with the next step, which would be very draft a draft MOA terms for consideration. Are we as okay a to go forward? Yes. Okay. Go right ahead. Thank yes, you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Where in Virginia Beach are we going to find a lowly used road? I'm just kind of wondering. It, so when I say low used low used road, it, it's um, relatively speaking, but f for us. Um, you know, there's a couple of different corridors we're looking at. Um, when we come back to you, we'll come back to you with some options. But there, there are some that are under, you know, 5,000 vehicles per day, as opposed to some our busiest corridor, Independence Boulevard, that's 70, 72,000 vehicles per day. So we are looking something that's in the 5,000 vehicles per day or less uh, type of realm. But something that still has some visibility and some use, some viability. So we hope that when we come back to you, we'll have some options for you to consider. But this would be in time if there are things that need to be done to make it uh, acceptable, such as markings and so forth. I think you mentioned that we have time to do that within the budget and so forth. We, we would like to develop the program and the resources together. So um, we want to work in workmanlike fashion, but we don't want to rush this. So we want to work to get the resources and make any improvements needed or purchase equipment and in install it just in a in a logical fashion, but not rushing it. We want to make sure we get it right. Okay, anybody else? Yes, Max. Well, good afternoon again. <coughs> Please take the microphone. <laughs> no, you got to be the spotlight, Max. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank council. Uh, these are exciting times for the beach. And they're really exciting times for Dominion. I don't know another jurisdiction in the Commonwealth of Virginia that has more activity with technology than here in Virginia Beach. So we have the autonomous shuttle with Julie. We are going to introduce electric school buses in the fall of 2020 for Virginia Beach. And we obviously have our uh, kind of our crown jewel, the offshore wind project that is moving quite quickly. Uh, we've announced the commercial operation of that, which ultimately will generate 2,680 megawatts coming into the Commonwealth of Virginia into the, the grid of Dominion. So again, on behalf of Dominion, I just want to thank the council for your vision, uh, your cooperation, and everything you're doing. And I'm obviously biased since I am a resident of the city of Virginia Beach. But again, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Henley. And we need to thank you all. I mean, it's kind of neat to look at the offshore wind at the same time we're looking at something like this. I, I think that's really admirable and I know y'all take a lot of flack as do we so uh, we we can thank you for being uh, visionary and and willing to be visionary yes ma'am okay thank you thank you all thanks very much folks appreciate it power too <laughs> we can work on that. <laughs> <laughs> all right moving on mr lady so um mayor and members of council are uh, next briefing is um, by Diana St. John, and she <laughs> is uh, heading up our uh, uh, Public Works Stormwater Water Quality section. And Diana is going to uh, talk to you today about our Stormwater Quality Program. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of City Council. Today we'll be pro providing you an update on our Stormwater Regulatory Program. We'll be reviewing our team the programs we implement, our accomplishments during the past year, and our planned effort moving forward. 
We have a dedicated team focused on our stormwater regulatory programs. Our largest effort is related to compliance with the city's Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System Permit, or MS4 for short, that regulates the discharge of stormwater from our city system. The permit has a five-year compliance schedule, and we were issued our latest permit in 2016. The MS permit is administered by the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, with oversight from the EPA, and is authorized under the Clean Water Act. As part of the MS4 permit, the city must regulate new construction. In this role, the city ensures that we are in compliance with our ordinances for both stormwater management and erosion sediment control for land disturbing activities. And our group also is involved with commercial property owners and helping them administer, or excuse me, where we administer the stormwater utility adjustment program. This program allows for the commercial property owners that have and maintain stormwater management facilities to receive a discount on their stormwater utility bill of up to 50%. We are part of the overall stormwater program, combining with flood control and operations and maintenance to design, construct, manage, and maintain stormwater resources throughout the city's three main watersheds. Stormwater quality and regulatory make up just under 16% of the $55 million FY20 CIP budget. Our most significant function is in the implementation of the MS4 programs, with over 70% of our effort towards this. The MS4 elements include the water quality improvement projects, water quality monitoring, and the programmatic functions. We have about 25 pro program areas that have specific requirements for implementation under the permit. These range from developing and implementing plans to reduce stormwater pollution, designing and constructing water quality projects, performing water quality monitoring, inspecting industrial facility outfalls, managing our stormwater infrastructure data, and providing education and outreach to our residents and visitors about preventing pollution. Many of these requirements must be conducted and reported on an annual basis. So what have we been working on over the past three years? The MS permit has detailed requirements and specific reporting for each year of the permit. Some of the key requirements for program year three are identified here with the most significant effort on our development of stormwater pollution prevention plans for some of our city facilities and continued progress on strategies to ensure maintenance of stormwater management facilities without maintenance agreements. And we've also reported on our roadway maintenance protocols and advanced the design of several water quality improvement projects. For this presentation, we wanted to highlight the Southern Boulevard water quality project. This is a cost participation project for the construction of a wet pond that provides TMDL credits for the city. And this project is nearing completion. What are aquatic benches? They are vegetated areas around the, uh, sur the surface area, the perimeter of the pond, and that provides additional water quality benefit uh, for the pond itself. Yeah. On that. So when we planted all those plants at Mount Trashmore Lake, mm -hmm. that died? Then they decompose. Do we then lose the benefit that we got when they were alive because now that's decomposed and methane released and everything else in the waterway? So do we get penalized for their death or we just get credit when they're alive? We do not get penalized for their death. But if, if the pond, in this case the Southern Boulevard pond, if it's designed with that characteristic and the design and the associated pollutant reduction is based upon having that bench, then we would have to replant the bench. I'm just want people to know that we, I, I have a question in query, but we spent $90,000 putting plants in Mount Trashmore Lake and they're now dead. Mm -hmm. So I just thought people, I just, like, I'm looking forward to that answer, but okay. I just want to understand how that happens. Implementation of our program requires significant coordination, both within the city and with external agencies and stakeholders. The Hampton Roads Planning District Commission holds regular meetings throughout the year, giving Virginia Beach and other MS4 permittees the opportunity to learn, share, and strategize. We have also continued our dialogue with the Hampton Roads Sanitation District relative to nutrient and sediment credits in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. 
following the memorandum of agreement that was signed in 2017. If you recall, this MOA results in over $300 million in savings to the city related to our specific TMDL requirements that are set forth in our permit. Could you tell me, I'm sorry, what TMDL? Total maximum daily load. Thank you. You're welcome. SWIFT, the sustain Sustainable Water Initiative for Tomorrow, is a program by HRSD to treat the wastewater to drinking water standards and then inject this treated wastewater into the aquifer. Through the reduction in the total volume of the HRSD discharge into our bay and the corresponding reduction in pollutants, a permanent offset of the bay TMDL MS4 load reduction is gained. The SWIFT program is in its pilot phase and is being reviewed currently by DEQ and the EPA. As we move on from year three, the requirements during the fourth and fifth year will increase as we near the end of our five-year permit term. We'll be completing construction of projects and finalizing our stormwater infrastructure data across the city. We'll also be installing storm drain markers at city and school facilities and fully establishing our public education programs. This permit term is focused on project planning. We're identifying, identifying sites where we could potentially implement water quality improvement projects throughout the city. We will also need to file a permit reapplication package in just over 12 months. As a stormwater management and erosion sediment control authority, we ensure compliance with our ordinances on projects managed by Public Works Engineering. Our team is responsible for plan reviews and construction inspection for our public capital projects, including transportation and flood control projects. We also manage an off-site credit program for phosphorus reductions for our CIPs. This effort is similar to the state banking program, however, it can only be used for public projects and not for private development. We implemented this program to support public projects that are located in areas that don't have space to locate new stormwater management facilities to address the required phosphorus reduction. In addition to the project design reviews, we also assess the pollution prevention planning of our construction projects, as well as document and report on land disturbing activities. We also track the training documentation for these programs for the city. Our team also helps support the stormwater utility program. We administer the fee adjustment program that provides a reduction in the stormwater utility fee for commercial property owners that install and maintain a stormwater management facility for their development. This involves the review of applications <coughs> and engineering calculations to determine the amount of the adjustment that can be applied to a customer's bill. There are a few ways a customer can have an adjustment made on their stormwater utility bill. A non-residential customer that has an on-site stormwater management facility with a recorded maintenance agreement is eligible to request a fee reduction. A stormwater management facility that provides water quality control may request up to a 30% fee reduction based on the facility type. And a facility that provides water quantity control may request up to a 20% fee reduction. Those reductions are additive, resulting in the maximum fee reduction of 50%. To achieve the reduction, this facility must maintain its functionality with no major maintenance repairs needed. The exact amount of fee reduction depends on the facility type and the ability of the facility to provide flood control. For example, a wet pond designed for water quality and flood control that treats the entire property would qualify for the highest reduction of 30 plus 20 or 50%. A manufactured device that only provides water quality and no flood control would qualify for a 10% reduction. I want to mention a couple of other ways a customer may have their utility bill adjusted. One way is to ensure that the impervious area estimated for the property is accurate since the bill is based on the ERU, which is calculated from the impervious area. And that was discussed at last week's briefing. Should a property owner dispute their ERU, we will perform an evaluation of the property to verify this impervious area. 
Adjustments, if necessary, are reported to the utilities billing department for the adjustment to be made on the next billing cycle. We will typically verify a few hundred properties per year. Properties may apply for a 100% reduction if the utility fee, in the utility fee, if stormwater is not discharged from the property during the 100-year storm, or if the property directly discharges to the Atlantic Ocean or the Chesapeake Bay. Although our team continues to do great work, it is not without its challenges. This slide represents our current organizational chart. Out of the 15 approved FTEs, we currently have seven positions that are vacant and two positions on extended leave. Four positions were directly impacted by the tragedy of May 31. Two items to note. First, we have significant shortage and supervisory and management positions. And second, two of the three major functions, namely the water quality unit and the VSMP unit, unit have significant shortages. This lack of resources has presented substantial challenges to ensuring the city is compliant with our permit and to providing the desired level of service to our customers, both internal and external. Project and program implementation will experience delays. Our current focus is to endeavor to meet the minimum requirements of our permit by the end of our five-year permit cycle. We will continue to leverage contract support to help fill the gap. We also have four engineering annual services contracts that we use to support our project planning, TMDL action plans, our various inspection programs, and our water quality monitoring. These contracts are critical to our success. These are a few of our significant milestones through June of 2021. Each year involves an extensive annual reporting effort. As we approach the end of the five-year permit term, we'll be finalizing the next phase of our Chesapeake Bay TMDL action plan, submitting our permit reapplication, and completing all of the current permit requirements. We'll also begin negotiating the next permit with DEQ that will run from 2021 to 2026. There's a lot of work to do over the next two years. The current staff are dedicated and have shown a tremendous amount of resilience over the last few months. Everyone has stepped up and performed duties outside of their previous normal. We appreciate the concern and support of everyone as we continue to navigate through these challenges. In closing, there are many benefits <coughs> from our regulatory programs, compliance being our number one goal. Another goal is the effective project delivery for our transportation and growing number of flood control and water quality improvement projects. Our ultimate benefit to our residents is improved local quality. Thank you for your time, and I'll be happy Thank to... you. Barbara, and then John. Well, <clears throat> when I read your report for today, you know, just knowing that you all are a dedicated team, I want you to know that that just spoke so much, what you all have been able to accomplish is an amazing amount. Um, you know, we don't, we think about stormwater and we're thinking quantity, and you know, we kind of forget about the quality piece. And it's so important because of all of this regulation you have to meet, and the infamous MS4 permit and so forth. And, um, but in looking at what you've accomplished, I looked at last year's report. <coughs> And um, pretty astounding. And I know that last year, you know, I made notes that you had 11 FTEs and had challenges with that. And of course, then now you've got 15, but I suppose that you were not able to even think about adding those four new positions because of the impact that you've had. And Correct. So now that you are. I, I just really don't know how y'all have done it, but they've done an amazing job, an amazing job. Thank you. And, and for uh, that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for that, we appreciate it. And I, I, I know that, that quality is a, is a commitment of the people in this team and, and in, in making sure that we try to do these things. And, and I just really want to say uh, your report, uh, Y'all do y'all go above and beyond, and I was particularly thinking of the uh, additional water quality monitoring y'all did on the Astral Bridge Creek watershed. Uh, 
because of the concerns there. And I just want to say how much I appreciate just the in-depth analysis that was done. And this, this report result was in my packet on May 31st. Um, and, and I haven't had a chance to say, you know, how, how much I appreciate this work and, and the in-depth uh, analysis of everything that could be thought of as, as being a, a possible pollutant in there. And, and I think the, the commitment to make certain that, you know, we're not overlooking quality when we're trying to get the water off is, is something that maybe people don't recognize. And, and you know, with all of this, these requirements with the TMDLs and uh, tracking all of that, I, I guess with the Chesapeake Bay TMDLs, we've, we've turned out to be able to do a far better job than we first thought we were going to because of, of innovations and so forth. And, but then we have these other um, places around the city that, that have uh, um, requirements Correct. that have to be monitored as well. And to have this small group of people able to do all that, I don't know how you've done it, but thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, John. Well, a very nice report. I appreciate it. But it is principally an activity report. There really isn't any data analytics in this report. I know it wasn't designed to do that, so that's not a criticism. But I do think the public, and certainly I'd like to know, is where we started, what is the quantitative <coughs> gain we've achieved? We had these different standards. We're supposed to get to a certain place. And I assume you are monitoring each of these outfalls and are collecting data. Is that correct? We do not have to collect data at every single outfall. But we, are, we do have a system of analytics that, that we do track. We report on them annually. Our reports are posted on our web page so the public has access to them. Um, Is your methodology something that EPA has to approve to be statistically representative? We, we have to follow EPA protocols, yes, sir. Is that in a document also on your website? I, I don't believe we have that on our website, but we talk about that through our, our Chesapeake like Bay Action that. Plans. I'd just and like our to understand it, because I think in all these cases, do we know, like, for example, we made a big investment in a place and we thought we were going to get X gain, mm -hmm. did we actually get the qualitative gain we invested in? That's what different from saying you comply, but we had an expectation. Mm -hmm. And I would be interested to get a data table that shows us what we invested, what the baseline was, and what we hope to achieve by it. Because I think that's something that, because uh, then, because I, and also will we know the HRSD credit that we'll be able to get as EPA comes back and looks at HRSD's plan mm -hmm. and if they approve the pilot for full implementation at both the Nansen and I believe it's another site on the peninsula for that, we will get a share of that credit. Is that not correct? That is correct. And do we know if their program is approved what that credit will be? They will provide. So our permit cycle, we are in the first five-year permit cycle of the TMDL implementation. In the first five years, we, had, we the city, had to reduce 5% of our pollutant load. The next five-year permit term will be an additional 35%, and then the final five-year permit term will be the remaining 60%. Right, well, trying HRSD to will provide the, the second and third permit cycles right, which reductions. Get ready to do the work for, correct? Correct. So um, as we do that work, before we complete it and make capital investments to comply, since debt and timing and expense is time-sensitive, mm -hmm. will we know the credit we receive so that we can size our CIP investment to achieve the requirement so we can make sure we're not consuming Yes, we will know, and HRSD services. has committed to providing what we need to achieve the requirements of the permit. Yes. Okay. And that's being, then the price cost of all the that will be reflected in the HRSD's rate. Is that correct, Tom? HRSD's <laughs> rates are co compensatory. If they yes. encounter greater cost to what they're doing, their rates will go up. Now, I think they're, the way they're approaching it is, is the cost of this program is there also is offsetting costs that they would have in other parts of their system. So it's not clear that, I don't know that this is necessarily additive, but their rates will be going up to help pay for the SWIFT program. What I was, was after is we would have one level of capital investment and operating expense we would incur absent the HRSD initiative. The HRSD initiative will allow us to do 
y minus x, whatever we're getting from HRSD reduces our requirement for capital improvements and operating expenses and still meet our reduction requirement. It, it reduces what the projects we would have to do in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Correct. We still have, as Ms. Henley pointed out, other local TMDLs that have to be addressed. Now, that Chesapeake Bay deals with the consent decree. Do we have a, a other kind of legal obligatory area and things that are not part of the consent decree? I didn't think we were operating under any legislative mandate relative to our other watersheds. Am I misinformed? I'm sorry, I didn't. The consent the, decree covers the Chesapeake Bay and the watershed through many states. Mm -hmm. And we signed a consent decree, which gives us all these prescriptive and people can take us to court if we don't meet them. I got that. I'm asking these other areas outside that, are we operating under obligatory, legally non-discretionary actions to take to reduce TMI? I'm just trying to make a distinction between obligatory and discretionary investments. So we are, the MS4 system is uh, uh, mandated and required, and that is what is uh, requiring us to make these TMD redu reductions throughout the city. Uh, right, but I understand there, the Chesapeake Bay imposes higher levels of reductions than the others. Is We're, that not correct? We are only required to do what our permit tells us to do. Now, as I said, in the next probably year, year and a half, we'll be negotiating our next five-year permit term. So at that time, DEQ could come in and and add additional requirements to us. But currently, as of today, we have to meet what's in our current MS4 permit. Well, I was on the impression that the consent decree imposed higher requirements on us than just I think what you're, we do for the well, state. The, um, H, because HRST is involved, we're intermixing the sanitary and, sewer and the storm. Uh, consent decree with the stormwater regulatory mandates. They're, they're all mandated, but they're not uh, directly related. Uh, this is HRSD's SWIFT plan is uh, that uh, in solving their problems on the sanitary sewer side, uh, they would also create these credits that the okay. jurisdictions could use. And I do need to say, make one thing important. The 95 percent, the Phase 2 and Phase 3 TMDL costs are not in our programs at this time. Is that correct? That's correct. We're so, assuming they're being covered by HRSD. So, and they, the savings to us are estimated in the neighborhood of hundreds of millions of dollars, but they're not program now so when that if that savings comes comes to pass and we certainly hope it does it means those are dollars will not be added to our CIP not that it is freeing up anything that's in our CIP today my Good other point. question last question is as we have these new standards we've established for a new development going forward independent of whether they get a credit or not they still got to do them right and we don't have that much undeveloped land but how much is that land develops will give us credit because of what it what it would do to water quality as they put those things in place, especially whether we're doing redevelopment. I realize you're taking vacant land. That's not going to get you very much. But when people are redeveloping on a whole scale, like uh, the Lytle grocery store, good example. Mm -hmm. They put an underground bladder system so they could have plenty of parking. Right. So there's a case where there was nothing, and now there's something very substantial. So that's a benefit we, of treatment stuff we didn't get before, and now we do. So that somewhere should show up in our system as a, a, a benefit that we didn't have. Do we capture that? We do. So it's, it's two separate programs that we are involved with. When a developer builds on a piece of property, they have to meet the stormwater ordinance, and they have to reduce pollution because of the imperviousness that they're adding to their site. So that's a separate tracking than the TMDL aspects that we track to meet our MS4 permit. They're two separate programs. Yeah, but, I'm but, but we track the, the BMPs as part of our MS4. So you can't, let's say they had to, re, to remove five pounds, and they did remove five pounds. We don't get the five pounds on the TMDL side. That's just what they had to do to keep what they call keep it even for the development. Well, well my point is when the, when the area was already 100% covered with asphalt, which that site was. Mm -hmm. and redevelopment so, is another story. Then we can, we can get can't, the credit. Okay, correct. that's what I was really asking. A redevelopment, we can get the New credit. New development, no, unless you're going above and beyond. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. You're welcome. Okay, anybody else? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good really job. appreciate it. All right, so, wow, right on time. Um, so... So, Council, you have indicated desire to have uh, more time for um, uh, deliberations and discussions, and the issue that was raised last week was budget, and the amount of time that was suggested was about an hour and a half. 
and uh, so we're 10 minutes ahead of schedule. All right, good so. deal. Okay, uh, you know, the thing is, you know, probably one of the most important things we do as a council is the budget, and uh, it, it, maybe we can be open to any type of suggestions or considerations that would improve the process. Anybody like to get things rolling? Well, Mr. Think, Moss? I sent everyone an email. I'm sorry it was so late in the evening, uh, because I think uh, there's a lot of questions that we need to think about and pose to ourselves to where we want to go, because we've got a lot of information. You know, we know we have above average cost of living and below average national average wages. We know we have 40% of our kids on free or reduced lunch. We know 53% of our population that rents pays more than 30% of their income on rent. So we know we have a very kind of bimodal income distribution within our community. Some people are doing very, very well, and but there's a substantial number that aren't doing so well and they're pressed. Can I ask you a question mm -hmm. before you go further? In no way questioning your... Um, your statistics, and I've, but I've heard many times you reference the um, above average cost of living and below average wage, and I think that for the public it would be interesting to know um, where you've arrived at that conclusion, where those numbers are coming from. I'm not questioning them at all. I'm just would there like are, to know. There are Department of Labor issues SMA, and you, know, you may we saw when I mentioned that the five-year forecast, the 118 percent, the economists came back and said, yeah, well, I that's didn't one. Yeah, the source. So okay. The Bureau of Labor Labor Statistic Labor. puts all these stuff out. Another place you can go is our bond prospectus. If you go and look at the bond prospectus on a quarterly basis, the Virginia Employment Commission composes and reports uh, total salaries and by segment of the <coughs> workforce, retail, wholesale, and you can look at all the statistics and tell you how many people work. And we all know that everybody who lives in Virginia Beach doesn't work in Virginia Beach, and we are a net importer of high-wage income. So those are all things you can get HRPTC, or you can look at Dr. Cook. So all those things. And the thing about rental, that's in the city's executive budget summary at the back under demographics where those information is contained. So those are where those stats come from. And so they're – and – the national statistic was done by Bloomberg Finance, which was, and I don't know where they got their data, it's just a source that the top 10% of income people earn 70% of the national income stream, and the bottom 50% are 1%, and the middle 29, you know, I mean, the middle 40 are the 29%. That's just income distribution on an aggregate basis. But it just gets to the affordability and the financial stress that people are under. A majority of people who are seniors do get their sole retirement is Social Security, which is why the labor participation rate of seniors is much higher than even young people, which is amazing in itself, but that's just a consequence of health. I just think that gets down to the uh, issue about people's physical capacity to afford and afford what. The other aspect you may recall from the five-year forecast, they talked about how the budget was growing but it was growing at a faster pace than the GDP of the economy of the region. <clears throat> it was expected to grow at about 2 percent, but they said the budget was growing by 2.4 percent. That doesn't – you've got to know a lot about GDP. That isn't inherently bad, isn't inherently good, but you do need to understand that something's growing faster than the larger macro economy, and that only happens by one way. Usually it's tax increases or something else that takes place. So I just think that in our – I don't, as I said in my note, I don't think there's a, a majority here willing to provide prescriptive guidance like the governor or the president would provide to their, their folks to how to build the budget. We're not, I don't think there's a, a, a willingness to do that. So I think, but I think we ought to have and be identifying options to look at that are other than what we would receive traditionally. I, I just think that this is not a time to be raising taxes and fees on the population. Now, that com that's not free. You know, <coughs> not raising taxes and things aren't free. There is risk that you have to assume. I know the manager is asking departments to do 2 percent, show what 2 percent would do. But I just think knowing cookie cutter isn't usually, or salami slicing usually isn't the best way to do resource allocation. I think the city manager would probably agree with that. That isn't the best way. You need to be looking vertically and ranking your priorities one to end and taking the risk where you can best take it or change the way you approach in achieving business. One of them I mentioned, we tend to hire a lot of positions, but the direct productive work year of the public sector is about two to 250 hours less than the private sector. So if we're having trouble hiring engineer threes or twos or ones, and that's a structural economy issue, a good regional approach, why don't the three or four cities around here that are so good about doing a 
technology, come up with an omnibus RFP and go out and and go out and secure contract services for that work on a large scale. If you're kind of a monopolistic provider to some extent, like in healthcare, you're going to get a much better rate on buying a larger volume of workload because people can't af can't afford to not be a part of it. So we got to think of different ways of uh, labor strategies in a tight labor market to secure services, but to, but leverage you know our, our our buying power in the marketplace, just like a private company would do. And I think we need to do more of that because I think we get more productive work hours in some areas. And if we're not hiring to start with, then maybe that's a better strategy. Um, I just think we need to understand the risk of the choices we make impose on the living standards of the people who live here. And I know we say everybody loves the services. Well, if you never ask people and tell them the price, I don't know anyone who likes that stormwater management fee, uh, and, and I've had a lot of discussion on that, and I won't be, be, be go back to that again. I think it's the wrong approach. I think today's <clears throat> conversation kind of proved that everybody enjoys water quality, independent of the size of your lot, the house, or your size, or whatever. It's a common good, and it's the most existential threat we face. So I think we ought to ask ourselves, in looking at this budget, where can we take risk so we don't have to take risk on people's homes flooding? Where do we take risks elsewhere so at least we maintain, to still Michael's point, maintain what we have and get it fixed? You know, and I think some places in our budget we should be willing to make a, and then ask, are we willing to not raise taxes and fees for flooding maintenance? Because that should be a higher priority. But what is it that we had to eliminate to do that? And are we willing to raise taxes for what we gave up? That's a different choice. And I don't think anyone likes budgets that have false choices. And I just want, and so that's why I put my note is you can balance with gold watches, you can balance with gold, with poison pills, or you can balance with executable choices. Not saying they're not needed, it's saying that requirement is a lower priority than not imposing additional uh, financial stress on those who can least afford it. Now, unfortunately, as you all know, our ability to raise revenue is very narrow. We're either taxing wealth, which is an income tax or personal property tax. There's about 55,000 cars that don't pay personal property tax, so that's a, that's a tax expenditure of another sort. And, so, and then we have things like fixed fees or even sales tax, which are regressive. Those are regressive taxes. We don't have any, quote, unquote, progressive tax measures <coughs> in our city, so I appreciate the, the constraints that the manager operates on trying to cure it. And there really isn't any instant cure with the mechanisms that we have. But we can keep the increases at least equal to people's increases in income. And then if we want to do, which we can't do without more revenue, and I've said it many places publicly, we cannot do all we need to do with flood mitigation on current revenue streams, even if you went and found 5% to reallocate, which I think we could, it wouldn't be enough. So now you've got to ask the public, are they willing to take a sacrifice in their current standard of living, because they will, discretionary income-wise, to gain this protection for their home and their property and, and protect their community. I think they will. I, don't, I think people are much more, if they're getting something for their money and they know what they're getting, I think there'll be public support. But I just think it takes a lot of leadership to make that case. But when you do that, it's like your kid's going out taking this allowance and he buys records or buys a TV game and comes back and says, I don't have any lunch money. Well, people don't like to give you more money if they don't think you're using the money as frugally that you got for the purpose for which it was given. So I think the budget process is a good way to show that just like families are tightening their belt, that we could find some of the money, not all, some of the money uh, for flood maintenance and, and flood mitigation projects out of the dollars that we already have just like families have to cut back to make ends meet. And then the public, we're going to ask them, because it's going to cost probably eight cents to a dime to meaningfully accelerate flood mitigation so it makes a difference in anyone's lifetime of owning their property. But in return, their flood insurance goes down, and so they get a, a real get cheaper to pay a higher tax than to pay higher flood insurance, where all you're getting is money to if you have house floods. Who really wants to go through that? And I think that's what... And the other piece in that budget, which I asked this question for, and I know it will be somewhat controversial, but I asked the guy specifically, 
so the full VRS actuarial shortfall and all the health insurance increase was going to be borne by the taxpayers. Now, I don't know how many companies you all work with, uh, but that's generally a shared burden between the, the taxpayer and the employees. Now, maybe we got a better case if we want to continue that policy, which is, I'd say we, not we can't. We should be articulating that people are not getting a 2% raise, they're getting the 1% health insurance raise, they're, we're making their retirement whole against actuarial marketplace uh, risk, which no one gets with their 401ks, that is also a pay increase. And, and, I, and I think a lot of employees recognize that, but I think when we go out and say we're just doing a 2% raise, we're really doing much more than that. And I think the taxpayers know what great jobs our employees do, and they're willing to, to provide something they themselves don't get. But we ought, to be our, we ought to be communicating that in a way that recognizes that that, in fact, is in a total compensation package a a pay increase. It is a compensation increase. It's in the future, but future income matters. <laughs> Ask how many people went back to work because their 401k plans tanked. So I don't think we should understate the, the, the total compensation package when we communicate what we're doing for our employees. I'm not saying they don't earn it. I'm just saying we need to recognize that it's out there because uh, normally in, in industry that would be a, a shared, there'd be some shared portion of that. And then my last point, because other people would like to talk, is our health insurance costs, I noticed, were higher than our surrounding municipalities. Let me call a couple meetings back. I asked about, I know they have this pharmacy program in Chesapeake, which is supposedly, and I'll use that word supposedly because I don't know it for factually, has had a material difference in holding their pharmaceutical cost for their workforce uh, significantly down in terms of growth. And that is a major part of health insurance today is, is uh, drug reimbursements. And so I think we got to be looking at uh, some different approaches. And maybe we can't get it this cycle because maybe we're too far behind. I don't know where. I know that's out of cycle with the budget adoption. But clearly, there are other localities. Maybe it's benefits aren't as good, but I hear this from employees that our things are more expensive than our localities. And if we can change that material cost, that's, that's net money in people's pocket. So I, I think we really got to, since that's a, a good chunk of, our, our budget is a 3% increase in the back table. When you look at it, that's what's programmed anyway. I think we should be looking at ways to structurally move some of those costs to the left and be more engaging on health insurance benefits. But uh, I certainly, I always develop my own options, and I hope some of you have some. But I think, um, Mr. Mayor, that when we get the budget from the manager, however he composes it, I think we ought to, have people think about over the holidays maybe and come back in January <coughs> or maybe our next meeting and say, what are some options that whether it's Lewis or Jim or whoever around the table think what they'd like to see, especially with stormwater management. I'll have several things I think we'll look at so that we can at least show the public that we just didn't do that death by PowerPoint budget review, which is not a budget review in my opinion. It's looking at slides, but it's not really examining one to end the priorities. Are we going to modify our debt policy? That's a big discussion. I know you're doing some work on that, but that's a discussion we need to have. Is that the right policy? I know some people claim that our debt service is too high. I wish, I'm sure most people would wish their home debt service was 10%. I'm sure they would sign up for that in a heartbeat because most people is way more than that, but we're not supposed to emulate families necessarily. But I think we need to understand if we're going to do something meaningful in the flood mitigation thing, our current policy and income streams seem to be in contradiction and, or in conflict with that desire. So either one, we've got to communicate to the public that we're at, really at our limit and we have to go slow, and that's just because that's where we're at, or we're, we talk to the bond folks and financiers and saying, hey, we're trying to protect our $56 billion tax base, and they should be very interested in that, I would hope. And this is the nature of the investment, and how would they read that kind of investment versus just investing in consumption, but investing in protecting our, our hard assets? How would the market receive that? I think that's the kind of discussion that makes a material difference on whether or not we can move forward in a very good borrowing time. You know, 10-year Treasury notes was 1.75 the other day. We usually pay about 25 basis points over that. 
uh, for our general obligation debt. So I think there's some real opportunities that I would like to see as options in the, in the budget that we could consider. Not saying that they're recommended by the manager, but these are options if our desire is to go do flooding in 10 years versus at 15. Those are the things I would like to see us uh, examine and have some real uh, discussion about, because they do take some homework first. I admit that no one likes to do, make decisions without homework, but what we have to identify what we want to do homework with, because capacity of the staff <coughs> is limited, so we have to prioritize our ask. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Okay, Jim, then Rosemary. Thanks. Um, just before I ask, so one, one thing that John mentioned about the death by PowerPoint, I, I agree with you on that part, but I think I've heard a lot of positive comments from citizens because regardless of what we see from it, it is the one opportunity a lot of departments get to publicly show what they do, and a lot of citizens may have no clue what the voter registrar's office does or what agriculture does or what a lot of these other ones do. So I think for the fact of four or five or ten minutes that they do, I think it's it's probably worthwhile. I agree that, that our discussion is is separate from that and our, and our, our <coughs> decision points aren't necessarily influenced directly by that, but I think that is, in fact, very valuable to the citizens who, who actually watch this stuff. Um, I wanted to ask a question of the, uh, of the manager, or two questions. So first off, do, do you, Mr. Moss mentioned some targets, so do you have targets for departments? And then second, what is the schedule, your schedule for the budget going forward? So we have uh, told the departments that they would need to submit budgets that are, uh, their target would be 98% okay. of last year's, and that is an adjusted target. It's adjusted for uh, changes and things that have occurred during their year. It's not just 98% of the previous year's budget, but 98%. I could let uh, our, our budget people give you a little more detail if they want, but it would, uh, it does, a, it recognizes that there have been changes or added additions or subtractions from their budget. Okay. Uh, our schedule right now. Uh, is that uh, the departments are turning in their budgets, uh, requested budgets, pretty much as we speak. Today. Okay, today. today. And uh, at that point, then, uh, the Office of Management and Budget and I and the deputies uh, start putting all that together into the budget. We start reviewing it. Uh, we would have budget hearings in uh, January and February uh, and then bring you a budget in March. Uh, March 26th, 24th. Fourth Tuesday, uh, we would bring that budget to you. So that, that's the schedule as it is right now. It's pretty similar to the schedule it's been traditionally. Thank you. Rosemary? Um, <clears throat> John brought up the pharmacy program, which I talked to the former manager about in the past, too. And um, some of the teachers that I know that teach in Chesapeake say it's really been a significant uh, savings for all of them. And I. I think perhaps what we ought to do is to put together a joint exploratory committee with some people from the school board and some people from the council to look at what Chesapeake is doing and to see if we can duplicate that here. Um, so, you know, I'd like to propose that we, because it affects the schools as well as us, and we shouldn't just go out and do this on our own, but I think a, a joint committee to explore this pharmacy program no, if Chesapeake can do it and it's saving them a lot of money, mm -hmm. why wouldn't we look at that? Yeah, we've got to look at best practices at so other that's cities okay, for a we'll lot put of things. Together a resolution. So we'll put a resolution together to, um, if anybody objects, to form this committee. Okay, that won't be a problem. Anybody else? Barbara. Well, let them go. I'm, I'm well, well, I I yeah, okay. uh, I'm just going to, just a question. Uh, when John, I was wondering from your memo, John, whether you're, and you confirmed, you're talking about us coming up with different plans too. Uh, what about the the manager? I mean, I assume we are used to getting a budget that says this is it. If you want to change it, okay. kind of the burdens on you to change what, mm -hmm. what right. they put on the table. Correct. Is there a way to kind of do what you were saying, mm -hmm. but have the manager's uh, expertise in it too to give options that he would suggest? <laughs> uh, because I mean, I have a hard time just giving my knowledge without uh, of what's 
what's sustainable, what's doable. And the more people that are participating in it, I mean, I, I know you have some sensitivities about staff-driven things and, and the like, but I'm just asking, there's one more guy at the table that could come, got, knows a lot about this stuff, could come up with some options if we asked him to. Well, if you noticed in my note, my thing was coming up with, uh, email was coming up with the questions we want answered and then us deciding which options we'd like to have explored and then asking the manager, I think that's what my note said, having the manager present those options. My point was there's just limited options that they have the capacity to share with us, number one, and that's why I thought it was important if the body collectively, I think, since we are using the staff of everyone, should kind of decide which collectively does a majority of the staff want. If you want to know tax increase option, that's something we wanted to see and how that would what implications, you know, all this can look through gold plate and poison pill stuff, and I don't think the manager has any incentive to put together a not credible option. I don't. I wouldn't expect him to do that. And but, <clears throat> I think it ought to be a consensus of the body what options we want to pursue, and then if any of us have the talent to pursue their own options, you certainly can, and, and I have consistently done so. But I deal with a multi-billion-dollar budget myself, so I'm not scared by big numbers. But I think the options that he pursues should be one that the body, as a consensus, a majority agree need to be shared, not any one council member. I think, I think my email said that, I believe. You know, yeah, I, yeah, I, you know I was going to hold the comments to, uh, last, but one of the things that I was going to talk about, I think one of our things we should do is, you know, strive for a consensus budget, you know, to the point is where we're all, you know, you know, have this vision about what we want. But the other thing that comes with, I think, more collaboration and discussion, uh, you know, as we go forward. And one of the things about, you know, just the, the PowerPoints and everything, we get just raw data. But once again, you know, we're, each department looks at itself introspectively and almost do a SWOT, you know, SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats and the point how they can improve operational efficiency by reducing redundancies, collaboration, taking a look at outsource, uh, outsourcing, you, you know, in terms of whatever, you know, just being innovative in terms of, you know, how do we become more operationally efficient going forward? So, you know, the thing is, you know, Jim's right. I think we should have an executive summary for each department, but I think each department director should have the opportunity to say how they can significantly maybe downsize, improve, consolidate, or anything, and think in terms of out of the box, you know, on how to, you know, you know, maybe to do things. Yeah, yeah. I think even the idea about, you know, if we're short in IT, can we, co co uh, you know, we're engineers, can we collaborate with other cities uh, that might be able to, you know, do that in the areas of IT, engineering, and things like that. Uh, you know, you know what departments can we outsize, uh, outsource, and that might be able to, you know, uh, use outside expertise, and they pay their own employees and get reimbursed based on incentives. You know, it's, it would be out of the box thinking, but I think the important thing is that I think what's been missing before is ongoing uh, dialogue and collaboration between ourselves. Then we come up to maybe a, a budget and an alternative budget. It's a binary choice where. We should be striving for consensus all along. Okay, Barbara. Well, I wasn't going to mention this, but since you just kind of said those things, it, it makes me think of last year we, we changed our whole retreat process. But it was in the retreat that council would talk about what we wanted to see done, and now we are not having that opportunity but also as a part of preparation for the retreat, we would get a little document that outlined all of the things that each of the departments had done uh, during the year, how they had saved money, how they had <coughs> cut things. And I certainly hope we'll still be able to get a document of that nature yeah. because that certainly was uh, letting us know what had been done internally uh, by the departments to save money or to do things in a in a, a, a way that was uh, over-the-box thinking and so forth. So I think we have been doing those things, but I really miss not getting that update of all the things that we had indicated we wanted to achieve and who was doing it and where it was in the timeline. Uh, so by changing our process, uh, I, 
I think we have not been able to stay as involved as we were staying involved. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm not at the top up here with philosophy. I'm kind of down here with what I think we, you know, we're going to be faced with it in, in doing. And I think, you know, it's one thing to tell the manager we want a budget with no tax increases. However, we want you to do all these things. Uh, well, you know, I think we've all got our list of all these things that we would like to have done, and it's going to be a great challenge for the manager and staff to figure out what they're going to cut in order to allow us to do all these things we want to do. So I don't know. Somehow or other, there's got to be a middle ground, and I don't know when we have the opportunity to, to explore that, you know, without our retreats, but that's another thing. What I'm thinking about are some more specific things, and I'm thinking about what we did with last year's budget, and I know in my own case, I particularly asked in the in the uh, reconciliation that um, the uh, sea level rise study do some additional exploration to see how wind tides can <coughs> be addressed sooner rather than later, uh, and I indicated that I wanted to have focus groups uh, that allowed more input from the residents which we did, and I really appreciate the staff coming and and uh, <coughs> taking notes and, and I, all the people who came and responded, and I understand that that is being uh, looked at now uh, with this study. And so uh, we'll be getting, you know, the, the, and we're not supposed to call it Dewberry study, but I can never remember what we are calling it now, but we're going to be getting that presentation very shortly, and then there will be this additional work that will come later. But that's going to give us a lot of recommendations, and somehow or other, that's going to have to be folded into this budget. And I don't know how we do that uh, when we're going to be working through this process at the same time that the manager is trying to develop a budget. Um, I also had asked that uh, the Sandbridge, TIF, and SSD be looked at, and I'm, I'm very uh, happy that the, the staff is looking at that as well as uh, the the auditor, I think coming out of that, we're going to have some options to make sure that we're achieving that uh, in, in the, the best fashion. And so I do know that those things are ongoing, and I'm assuming that those things will have some uh, kind of uh, impact on what the budget recommendation is in those areas. But when we are getting this um, report that we're going to be getting, uh, and I was at the Open Space Committee yesterday, and CJ made a presentation, just his, I think it's his 52nd presentation, so it was just his general presentation, not something especially for the Open Space Committee. But in looking at particularly the policy report uh, that, you know, we've had now for almost a year, and I know that there are a lot of things in there that you know, are being looked at and we'll be getting some recommendations on, such as design standards changes and, and, and so forth. Uh, but I think the opportunities are in that report for us to make a lot of advancements in the whole stormwater issue that won't be costing millions of dollars, but will just be changes in the way we do things. And I think it's so important that we we, um, we look to ways that maybe we've already been doing some good things. Uh, for example, the beach restorations. Um, you know, look at Sandridge, five miles that we're, we're doing, and it's paid for. Uh, and, and this year, for the first time, we had beach restoration at all of our beaches. And I, I'm still amazed that that actually did occur. Uh, so that's the part of the flood program that we already have in place. And, and of course, and it's back to my open space thing, uh, noting that um, I think we got the most points in our community rating system because of our open space, so much of our open space. And I've said before, I really would like for us to look at bringing that program back with more purchases because I think that should be a part of our stormwater system. And I think when we look at what we have acquired in open space over the years, um, we'll see that a lot of it is a major part of our buffering system that, that is very uh, advantageous. As mentioned in the in the prog uh, this policy report, goals five, 
open space and ARP both being very good things. So we've got these uh, existing programs. But when I look at our, the report today with the open space, of course, you know, that's got a history, and that's 20 years now. Um, when, we, when we started that as one of the major projects, and we, we levied that tax increase on the meal tax of 0.44%, it was to fund the purchases, uh, and I think it's probably, and I think it is, I was surprised that it was, in our ordinance which established it that maybe at some time in the future when we were no longer purchasing, we would use that money for parks and rec <coughs> uh, uh, projects, which we're doing now. Um, I would really like to see us go back to using that for purchases, particularly targeted at properties which are uh, very valuable as far as uh, flood protection um, and, and kind of refocusing that, that project. It's already there. We've already raised the tax. The people are used to paying it, and from what I hear from restaurants, they're glad to be able to say part of it is going for purchasing open space, but it's no longer doing that except for paying off the bonds that aren't paid off. That, uh, that difference is going just for parks and recreation rehabilitation. We need to find some more money for that and go back to using the open space uh, funding for purchases. I really think there's opportunity there, but that's a part of our stormwater system that we don't have to go out and raise real estate tax or something. It's already funded in there if we look at it. I really think in looking at all of this, we have to look at what we're already doing <coughs> and <coughs> where the advantages are and, and really looking at the stormwater thing in a very broad way, not just looking at those projects that we see uh, quarterly and uh, how much to spend. My golly, if we had done that initial thing when we first got that list, Sherwood Lakes was on there for $20 million and Asheville Park for 35. Thank goodness that wasn't accurate. We've already completed Sherwood Lakes at $3 million, and we've done something different with Asheville Park. We are working through those things, but we don't just have to look at those big dollars. And I think on that, I was looking yesterday at what you all had recommended that we do, but doing all these beach projects was something that was on there. Well, we've done those, and we've come up with ways of doing them other than those big dollar things. So I really think we've got to have opportunities to, to talk about these things in a fashion once we get this report and, and it's all out there that not only we, the, the public, but we all get to look at this together and not just think in terms of big dollars, and this referendum scares me until we really know what these projects need to be. So that's my two cents worth in a long spiel on the flooding. But then the other thing that I think we've got to deal with in this budget was, you know, was this totally unanticipated thing with now what we have to do with the buildings. Uh, we do have to address that in this budget. Uh, something that we had absolutely no idea we were going to do. But then this report we got, not only in building these buildings, re <coughs> remodeling these buildings over the next four or five years, um, but looking at the recommendations that we got for security, uh, I think that's a big thing we need to look at. Uh, and I, I know that when we were talking about the design of Building 1, security was a big thing that we talked about, but I think we were talking about it from an exterior challenge and now do we need to go back to that building and look at interior challenges while this building is being constructed? Um, but we certainly, I think, have to follow those recommendations and look at all of our buildings and, and if there are things that we need to do and also <coughs> for our employee um, policies that we need to change. I've got a feeling there are some financial uh, uh, costs to those things. So my take on this budget thing is we all kind of need to say what it is we think we've got to address, and um, they're all going to have to be paid for, or we're going to have to say where we're going to cut. So that's my two cents. I'm sorry it takes so long. Oh, no, 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 that's we great. We've still got another hour. Everybody can talk. Yeah. Anybody else? We don't have to use it all. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, we don't have to use it all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. This gets back to, I'm just saying, Except do with much bigger money than the city has by tenfold. But when we're looking at budgets, we always look at once again. You talk your base. You tell people to generate retained earnings because you want to self-capitalize within your current income stream. 
and that generates, I don't know, in our case, maybe $20 million, but there's trustee accounts and things like that because 2% of a billion is $20 million. So you cut that down to 15, and you say, oh, gosh, I have must-pay bills, you know, whatever those are. It's that you did a pay raise, your law enforcement reform, all those things are must-pay bills. So you start drawing down your piggy bank, right, and say, okay, I spent that $15 million. doesn't take long, I'm certain. I know Tom probably knows from experience. It goes pretty quick. And then you look at the delta between the revenues that you collected in the year that you're executing, and you look at what you believe your forecasted growth in new revenues are, and then you say, do I have any must-fund must bills left? And if you don't, you can say, ooh, now I start looking at the things that, that that's different council members may or may not have on their shopping list. Maybe we set some priorities and hope one of them is fixing flooding maintenance. Let's hope. But whatever those priorities are in this body, you start spending that down. And then you say, you know what? We still have stuff we want for Christmas, and we haven't bought it yet. And then you got to ask yourself, well, is there something in that 98% base budget that you're willing to do without? It's back to Mrs. Henley's point, take a risk, make a cut, and you say, and there's a consensus, and you've whooped it up, you harvest the money, and you buy this new thing, because this is an old thing that's not a same of priority. It, it doesn't take long, and at some point you realize <coughs> there's only so much the public can afford, no matter how much they need, and you just put a stop on it, and then you, you move on. I mean, I, I think we never really think of the the budget in those big macro terms as we're looking at these lists, we get caught up looking at every department, and you're never going to make any really substantive priority changes if you get consumed looking at pieces, each piece of the puzzle. You've got to look at the puzzle itself and say, do I want a different puzzle? And if I want a different puzzle, how do I rearrange that differently? And if you make, we, like we did with some, like short-term rentals, we asked a lot of questions. Are you willing to do this? And we went around, and we kind of, we maybe didn't end up where any of us thought we were, but in the end, we found a vehicle to constructively get a consensus, and we all said, okay, it took us a while to get there, but I thought that, <laughs> well, yeah, but I do think that that approach did help us build a consensus by finally answering those fundamental questions, and we did get to a place of consensus, and I think the budget is kind of like those big hour clock movements on a clock. You're not going to find it looking at any little, it's going to be policy choices and priority choices that really generate restructuring and generate revenue. It's not looking for a nickel here and 1% there. We'll never get there. But one of the big things that builds the strategic narrative that we talk about, uh, where whatever that end state is, that's what I, and I think people will be responsive to that. And I, and I understand there are lower cost <coughs> things you can do, but if you live in Princess Anne Plaza where your house floods when a heavy rain comes, it's not a philosophical issue that a big project happens in your neighborhood. <laughs> That's not a philosophy. That is a reality. And they're afraid when it rains, or their kids are afraid when it rains. That's an anxiety, and I'm sure it's true with wind tides. So I think these are, and I think the public knows inherently that that's not free. But I think it is public safety, and I think we just have to tell the positive message and how we do that, and I'm with you on a consensus. I really kind of told myself, I really don't like building alternative budgets. It's a lot of hard work, I might add. <laughs> a lot of sleepless nights. I really want us to get to a place, and if it has to have a tax increase, and it's for something we're not paying for the base budget, or if it's changing the stormwater management fee to a tax, those are things I'm open to, personally. I'm just laying that out there. I have not precluded But I don't think we want to pass on price increases for the same service that people are getting. There's corporations aren't doing that. You know, it's just, it's just not today when people are, are, are pressed that we just got to find a better way. And I think our employees are probably know the best way to get that accomplished, to tell you the truth. I think they're, that's where the smarts are, and I think they're going to go tell Tom that. And if we can harvest $20 million, that's like three and a half cents of real estate tax. That's not insignificant. That's, that's real money. And if the school board, as the Vice Jones says, starts using their money that they get throughout the year for under execution, which $13 million of salary of benefits, and starts doing some of their capital maintenance, you know, rather than buying whiteboards and some other stuff, you know, they can help themselves too work down the maintenance of our buildings. And I think that pharmacy thing, I don't know how much we could say, so I don't want to give a number, but I think it will have a lot to do with the, the morale of our employees that we are listening to their feedback and we're acting on it. Uh, 
Anyway, that's. Uh, <coughs> oh, one last thing. That number about average wage and weekly wage, that actually the city staff researched that, and you got in your packet two weeks ago. You probably saw the newspaper article. I got it from the Washington Post, and then the city staff went and did the research and calculated it for our region. So that was another source of information. Is it possible for us to get a copy of the studies where some of these conclusions are, are drawn? And again, I'm not in any way questioning your conclusions. However, if we're going to use them as a basis to formulate a budget, I think it's important that we and the public know where we're drawing these conclusions. Right. Well, if you go back in your packet, two packets back, and I'll get it for you, but in that packet actually was the city staff deduction that our average weekly wage was $20.30, and that the national average wage, which is in that same study, that same article which you did get in your packet, was $23.70. You know, those are all those numbers came from staff research, but I'm happy to dig it back out. Or maybe, it again. maybe the staff could. Yes, but prior to you again. Okay, anybody else? Sabrina? I believe the essence of uh, Council Member um, John's comments are uh, in line with what citizens want. Uh, I remember um, being new to Council uh, and hearing from the citizens that they want the City Council to look at other ways of um, compiling a budget um, one that takes in consideration not to uh, raise taxes. And so um, I think we owe it to the citizens and the public to um, be uh, collaborative, open to um, other ways to um, manage bu the budget and offer services, um, you know, at a, uh, a, a, I guess, a different rate or lower rate if possible, but we owe it to them to find um, other ways to do it besides doing it the way we've been doing it um, uh, for so many years. And so I'm open to that. And I, I would like to see, you know, a budget that, you know, um, would not come with a lot of uh, raised taxes with it. Um, so that would be my goal to find ways to um, offer those services that we have in a way that doesn't raise taxes. Okay. Anybody else, Guy? Uh, I, I, my comment's pretty simple. I just think we have to answer to the fact that controlling stormwater flooding is a core function of city government. I mean, we just have to <coughs> accept that as a premise, and we have to live by it. And that we have to have a budget that reflects that, and we have to have a strategy that reflects that. Um, and I, I agree with Councilman Moss. I think the public can accept that as well. I think they're ready to. Um, I'm, without saying where that takes us, I just say as a principle, um, it's an important one. And it may be that Council feels, feels that it has done that previously, but that's, I don't believe that's the sense that I have or that the public has either. So I think we have to re commit ourselves to that principle. Uh, and, and, and that may take us to some very difficult decisions uh, to make. But I think that's why they're paying us the big bucks, so to speak. Okay, anybody else at this point? To, if I you know, just bring this to a close, this is a good discussion, and I think it's a good idea that we, from that, you know, going forward, we have these opportunities to talk about things like this. Uh, two important things, you know, going forward as we confront billions of dollars in stormwater, but also a billion dollars in school modernization and uh, replacement and all the other infrastructure and things as we go forward. We have to bring in new revenues, and that means economic development, you know, bringing in those new biz businesses, leveraging the fact that broadband is coming here, creating those new revenues. But the other thing is, uh, you know, I agree that, you know, we should, you know, the, the word collaborative and consensus, I think, is what we have as a body have to go forward and try to do. And Mr. Leahy, I'm assuming you're going to have individual interviews with each council person, you know, about their needs and wants. Would it be possible that once you, you know, complete that, that we could kind of get a summary 
you know, to, to the fact that this way we all know what everybody's thinking about. There might be some duplication and, uh, you know, things of that nature. But once again, I think during the, um, you know, when the department heads are presenting that we have the opportunity for, you know, once again, we've been doing, you know, discussions and, you know, but we're looking for innovations, new ideas. I think, you know, I think Rosemary brought it up, you know, if we can somehow, imp you know, reduce costs by pharmacy programs or, you know, shopping, uh, you know, for health program or whatever it takes in terms of what to do. And, you know, just thinking out of the box and, you know, uh, you know, working with other cities, combining services or whatever. But, uh, but what it maybe also consider a thought that, you know, uh, sometime before the reconciliation, you know, that maybe we get together as a body, you know, to, you know, to actually have a, a you know, a discussion and collaboration. Uh, I don't know how, the, you know, the rest of the council feels about that, but had the opportunity, you know, to weigh in and, you know, to shape the budget prior to reconciliation, you know, to, you know maybe come to some consensus and talk about the positives and negatives about uh, the approaches going forward. So we go into, you know, not only uh, reconciliation unified, but the public knows exactly the deliberative thought that we went into that put into the budget. So they know, that, you know, that, you know, the challenges that we've had and the opportunities we have and, you know, what we've been doing. And so I, I bring that up as a thought. Okay. 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 Thank you all. Very good discussion. Thank you. Michael, I was not the